Good evening, everyone. You're in the right place at the right time. This is Coast to Coast AM, blasting out of the Mojave Desert like a Scirocco, blazing across the land, into your town, into your home, slamming into your radio like a supercharged nanoparticle of unobtainium. Greetings from the boldest, bawdiest, most outrageous city in the world, the planetary capital of sun, fun, sin, sex, and secrets, my not-so-humble hometown, Las Vegas, Nevada. My name is George Knapp, your occasional host, designated driver of the airwaves, and moderator of tonight's upcoming cacophony of conversation. Tonight, we take a step back in time, 25 years to be exact. 25 years ago this month, something happened here in the Nevada desert that caused changes on a tectonic level for the world of ufology. It caused dramatic upheavals for the military and intelligence agencies who had previously had very little scrutiny for the stuff they'd been doing out there in the middle of nowhere, far removed from prying eyes of the public and the press and Congress, anyone. And what happened 25 years ago this month also caused dramatic changes on a personal level for the people we'll hear from tonight. And that includes yours truly. Uh, Think about a list of the most famous military bases in the world. Maybe Fort Knox comes to mind. Fort Knox, been around forever. It's where our government supposedly stashes its huge stockpile of gold. Highly secure facility, very strict security, very famous place. Been in movies and TV shows and songs. If you look for Fort Knox on Google, you'll see an astounding number of links and references. 7.3 million as of this afternoon, which is, wow, a lot. But enter the term Area 51 and see what you get. A hundred times as many as Fort Knox. 706 million results for Area 51. That base, which at various times the government has disavowed or pretended didn't exist or pretended didn't have a name, uh, a place that was shown on maps and then vanished from those maps, it's an oxymoron of the highest order, a secret place classified off-limits Yet, it has certainly become the most famous secret place in the world, which is sort of odd. Not much of a secret anymore. Uh, It's been the subject of dozens of books, thousands of news articles, untold numbers of TV news stories and specials, several motion pictures. These are major movies, as well as schlocky, low-budget thrillers. It's the only base in the world that's inspired rock and roll bands, bars, songs, poems, Countless products, from alien jerky to Bob Lazar Christmas ornaments to shot glasses, T-shirts, ashtrays, maps, handbooks, keychains, a blow-up love doll. Uh, There's now an extraterrestrial highway running past the base. It's uh, been sanctioned by the state of Nevada as as a tourist attraction. Our AAA baseball team here in Las Vegas is the 51s. Uh, Area 51 has been the theme for our Nevada Day celebration, Nevada's birthday, that is. It is quite simply the best-known military base in the world. It's known everywhere, every continent, in every culture on this planet. Every news organization in the world has beaten a path to Area 51's door. And still, every day, 25 years later, every single day, there are people out there on the perimeter of the base with their radios and their binoculars and telescopes and other kinds of gear staring into the skies, looking for whatever it is that might be zipping around, whether it's uh, secret airplanes or flying saucers or whatever, and at the same time trying to keep themselves from uh, running afoul of the legendary camo dudes who are out there patrolling the base. And all of this, all of this hoopla can be traced directly to one guy. I mean, Area 51, the base has been around since 1955. It was no secret to aerospace types or people who had worked out there or the people who lived on its perimeter. No secret to the Russians because they threw, uh, flew these spy satellites over the base on a regular basis. It was no secret to a couple, a handful of Nevada journalists who's written a story or two about it. But when Bob Lazar told his story to KLAS-TV in 1989, everything changed. Everything. Uh, Things changed for him, too, and not in a good way. Though the fact that he is still alive today suggests that he probably did the right thing by stepping forward. Uh, To set the stage a bit further, I can tell you that uh, prior to 1989, I was considered a straightforward news reporter. My career was on an upward path. 
I was working at a terrific news market, maybe the best news market in the country. Uh, KLAS-TV is the, the, the best news organization in the state of Nevada. I covered all the usual stuff you might expect. Uh, organized crime, uh, crooked politicians, sex scandals, bad cops, murders, bikers, fires, pot farmers, crack peddlers, you name it. I was generally respected. I was on my way up. And then along came Area 51, John Lear, Bob Lazar, Gene Huff, and everything changed. Um, you know, thank goodness I had the support of a great news organization because it was rough sailing there for a long time. The public ate this stuff up, as you all know. Uh, but my colleagues in journalism just couldn't help themselves in taking pot shots at something that they clearly did not understand and which they've never put much effort into figuring out. I, I, I guess it's far easier to make wisecracks and jokes than, the, than to sit out there in the dark watching the skies, dodging patrols, and coyotes and dust devils are interviewing the witnesses or reading about it. Uh, 25 years later, not a day goes by when someone does not ask me about Bob Lazar or Area 51 or flying saucers. And whenever I cover a story on some other topic that makes someone mad, which happens on a regular basis, uh, given the nature of the work that I do, Area 51 and Little Green Men is what they dredge up to try and attack my credibility. Kind of comes with the territory. I'm not thin-skinned about it, but it does amaze me how little the critics know about the story or the assumptions they make about the people who were involved from the beginning. There is an amazing amount of bad material out there, phony authorities, misinformation, deception, character assassination, and flat-out lies. And we're going to cover all of it. Tonight, to mark uh, 25 years since the story broke, I did my best to coax Bob Lazar into coming back to speak with us about the wild ride that he's been on with a handful of uh, people along for the ride, uh, including Lazar's close friend, Gene Huff, who was part of this story from the beginning. Uh, if you've been on the fence about the Area 51 story, uh, maybe we can address some of the questions that are floating around in your head. Webmaster Tim Benall and I put together a collection of material directly related to our discussion tonight. You can find it and a lot more on the Coast to Coast website, some of it under NAPS News. And some of it might be best to digest after you hear this show instead of during, because there are some lengthy segments there. And, you know, some of this material is going to test the limits of your home computer, I think, too. For, for one thing, there's a terrific panorama of Area 51, Groom Lake, a.k.a. Dreamland, the ranch, the box. It's known by many other names, a place that, you know, doesn't exist. This was put together by an avid investigator, a military watchdog. His site is LazyGRanch.com. Uh, those who know the Bob Lazar story know that he reported working at a facility that's uh, part of the Area 51 complex, but separate from the main facility at Groom Lake. It was designated as S-4, adjacent to Papoose Dry Lake, south of Groom. The military has always uh, denied they had anything ever at that site, let alone a facility built into the side of the mountain designed to look like the desert floor, which is what Bob Lazar says he saw. A guy named James Wildermuth uh, used Google Earth to look around at Papoose Lake and found what he thinks are the outlines of nine hangar doors in the desert. He produced a video to share his findings with the world, and tonight we are sharing it with the Coast audience for the first time. Check it out. Let me know what you think. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Bob Lazar's tale or how it all started, there are two stories that uh, I wrote. One is a magazine piece that came out this month telling how sort of I became ensnared by this whole mystery surrounding the base and Bob Lazar. And we dug up an oldie but a goodie, the original news report in which Lazar revealed his identity to the world. It's about 14, 15 minutes long, which if you think about it, that's pretty amazing length for a TV news story. More amazing is the fact that I had brown hair back then, so don't be shocked. I thought you might enjoy seeing the story as it unfolded back in November 1989. We've been trying to post a video that was sent to me by a producer and editor, an enhanced version of a saucer-like object, which Lazar and his friends videotaped outside Papoose Lake, March 1989. I think we're having some problems with that, but I promise you we'll work on it and we'll be able to put together maybe a shorter, more digestible version of that clip, have it up by next Sunday, when uh, I will also be hosting this program. Also there, a Bob Lazar music video that should be worth a chuckle or two. Uh, we'll hear a clip from that a little bit later. And then finally, a link you might want. It's to a site called alienpropulsion.com. This was created just today as a place where you can write to Lazar, view materials related to his story, 
I'm not making any promises about him writing back to you, but the site will hopefully become some sort of a, a clearinghouse for information related to the story. There are already some items posted there, including a video snippet from Lazar's first polygraph test, and we'll hear more about that a little bit later. So check it out on the Coast website when you get a chance. Time now to take our first break. When we return, Bob Lazar and Gene Huff. I'm George Knapp, and this is Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to Coast to Coast. By now, you think uh, most people who know the Bob Lazar story have made up their minds one way or another. It's like a Rorschach test in a way. They believe him or they think it's baloney. And some think it's government disinformation. Lazar is working with, you know, the men in black. Some think he made it up in order to get attention. Uh, A lot of what I would classify as misperceptions or misunderstandings about Lazar start with wildly inaccurate assumptions about him. Uh, You know, I've compared Bob to Ed Snowden in that both men are what I would call reluctant whistleblowers. Contrary to some misperceptions, Bob is not a guy who is hungry for attention. The last time we interviewed him on this program was five years ago. It took me forever to get him to do it then. I bent his arm and got him to give me a TV interview earlier this year, only because it was the anniversary of the story. That wasn't easy. He was not a UFO guy before this whole thing started. He's not a UFO guy now. One man who was part of the Lazar saga before during and after the episode at S4 is his friend and former business partner, Gene Huff, a real estate appraiser here in Las Vegas, who sort of fell into this incredible tale uh, through a series of an accidental sort of series of circumstances. But he's seen it all, including the personal turmoil and toll the story has taken. Bob Lazar, Gene Huff, great to have you guys back on the show. Thanks, George. Hey, George. (laughs) <laughs> I can hear the enthusiasm just <laughs> oozing out of your voice, Bob. <laughs> it's 1 o'clock in the morning, for God's sake. Can't you have a show on at 5 o'clock? After George's succinct, in-depth opening, Bob, don't you feel anything we would have to say would pale in comparison to George's opening? <laughs> <laughs> I want to start with uh, personal stuff, because I think if people knew the personal side, Bob, the reality of it, that they would not... Uh, make the kind of misconceptions, jump to the conclusions that they do. I remember the day that we revealed your identity to the world, November 10th, 1989. We're working on this video piece right up to the wire. And when it was time to rush to the control room, send them the tape, give them the final edited piece so I could go head out to the studio, you grabbed the videotape, didn't want to let go of it. Remember that moment? What was going through your head? I I don't think I can forget that. If I recall, we wrestled to the ground for (laughs) But, I mean, the point being, you know, for somebody who if the public thinks, boy, you couldn't wait to jump into this and tell everybody this story that you made up. I mean, everything about you uh, sort of is in contrast to the reality of that moment. No, that's true. I mean, you know, really, for the people that claim, um, you know, I fabricated this uh, for attention, there's somebody that really hasn't looked into anything. Um, yeah, it's, uh, like you said, it's, it, it, it hasn't been, it hasn't been a positive thing in my life. And it really, even to this day, I still question whether or not it was a good idea to, you know, release the information, but it was, it was really more you know, for self-protection at the time than to, uh, you know, release the information to the American public, which, you know, I thought was an injustice that they didn't, they didn't have. George, I think that he makes a very good point here in that when he first exposed this, the public didn't know why he was doing it. So they had to guess, well, is he doing it to make money or to become famous or for whatever reason? Of course, now those that know the story know that he did it just to go public to protect himself. And, uh, you know, as they were getting ready to yank his security clearance uh, due to other circumstances in his personal life, but to the innocent bystander, they had to, you know, try and assign a motive to why he was doing it. And that's so they that misconception was out there from the, the advent of the uh, expose. Well, let's let's maybe start with this is the idea that you're Bob, the UFO guy that drives you crazy, doesn't it? I mean, you didn't want to be famous. You certainly didn't want to be Bob, the UFO guy. You still don't want to be Bob, the UFO guy. No, I don't. I mean, how does that help anyone? You know, I run a, a scientific supply and and research business, and, uh, you know, it's hard for people to take you serious when you're known as Bob the UFO guy. And, uh, it, you know, I really do my best to divorce myself from it, 
Look, and like I said, I've always felt privileged to be part of the, the project, and it was fascinating while I was working on it. But, um, you know, one of the most popular questions I get asked is, well, how come you don't follow the world of UFOs now? Do you know this guy? Have you seen this video? No, I don't. I don't follow it at all. And one of the main reasons is 95% of what I've seen on the Internet and the videos and claims are absolutely ridiculous. So it's just too difficult to sort out the tiny tidbits of true and correct information, especially on the Internet, uh, amongst all the silly disinformation, lies, and you know, completely ridiculous stories. What were you doing? Uh, tell the audience what you were doing prior to, what you were doing for a living prior to getting hired out there. Boy, I think, I a, can't remember if, well, I think that's when I met Gene and I had, uh, I was process. developing uh, photos for real estate appraisers. I had a one-hour photo mini lab, and actually that was in my house at the time. And um, I was, I think I was just doing real estate appraisers, which is how I ran into Gene Huff. Gene, why don't you pick up the story there? The, the fact that Bob does not automatically remember exactly what he was doing before he gets hired out of there, you know, somebody would say, aha, man, he's just making this stuff up as he goes along. And you know him. You know him well enough to know why he has uh, difficulties and just just simple like stuff like that. And it, it, it deals with, you know, the personal side of the story and how it unfolded. Tell me that from your right. perspective. Well, Bob is a multi-talented guy. So while, yes, he did run jet processing uh, prior to uh, personal computers and and appraisal software and digital cameras, uh, any real estate appraisal had to have 35 millimeter pictures taped with double sided tape into every appraisal report. And so every real estate appraiser in in any locale had to either take their photos to a one hour photo, or in this instance, we had. Bob the photo guy, <laughs> who would uh, come to all the appraisal offices and pick up your film and return with all of your prints for real estate appraisals. So he was known as Bob the photo guy to all the real estate appraisers. But at that same time, Bob the photo guy would pull up in a, you know, a Firebird with a, a jet engine in it, you know. So <laughs> he wasn't your, your average guy. And, you know, he did, he did other things. He was into, he had a, a, a rail jet dragster and he was doing, uh, and music video production and, you know, you know, a very diverse range of interests and abilities. But but to the innocent bystander at a real estate appraisal office, he was Bob the photo guy. And um, For a day-to-day -day job, it was just, yeah, right. yeah, just, it was just uh, the uh, photo uh, processing uh, at that time. I mean, there was a lot of other stuff before and after. But, uh, yeah, and just he had worked at, time, at Los Alamos and Fairchild Electronics. And prior to that, this was just a little interim, uh, you know, business that he ran out of his home, as he said before. And you were applying for other stuff that led you out there, right? You, you apply, who did you apply with? Well, you know, I had taken, after I left Los Alamos and, in fact, started up photo business, it's kind of like I wanted a break you know, from science and technology, which I did for a few years, and then kind of got the yearning to go back. So I'd applied to other national labs and uh, one person that I applied to, which turned out to be extremely significant, was Ed Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb. Now, I had run into Ed Teller while I was working at Los Alamos. He was giving a, uh, a lecture there at the facility, and it was in the Los Alamos paper. In fact, that paper on the second page of it uh, is a little you know, blurb about how he's going to be speaking there. On the front page was me, and they had done a story on my jet car that I built. So I went and got off of uh, work that afternoon, went down to see the lecture, and <clears throat> I got there a little early, and Ed Teller was sitting outside reading the front page of the paper. So it was a perfect way to introduce myself since he was reading about me, and that's really how I... I initially met him, and, um, you know, fast forward years later, when I <clears throat> was sending out applications, 
or resumes or feelers, really, um, I made reference to that meeting. And fortunately, he remembered me. You were you were looking for wherever that might lead. I mean, you didn't specifically say, I want to work at Area 51. You just sent out a, 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 a well, I'll tell you what, the music is telling us we need to take a break. We'll pick up that story uh, and also talk a little bit about Los Alamos. And then those first heady days when you worked out there in the desert at this uh, once uh, secret facility. Stay with us, everyone. Much more to come with Bob Lazar and Gene Huff. Tom Petty takes us into the break. You might notice by the end of the program that all of the songs, or pretty much all the songs we're going to be using tonight for bumper music are from 1989, the year the Lazar story exploded onto the scene. Figured they'd help uh, sort of set the mood and remind people how long this story has been part of our collective memory. Uh, That uh, Tom Petty tune and this Don Henley hit... uh, Work on multiple levels. End of the innocence. 1989 is when the legacy of lies told by our government about UFOs came crashing down around our heads. My head, certainly. Maybe yours. Certainly true for Bob Lazar and Gene Huff and a couple of others we're going to talk about tonight, including a man named John Lear. More on that a little bit later. When we come back, we pick up the tale about uh, Lazar's work at Los Alamos and then uh, his first day on the job out there in the Nevada desert. Stay with us. Much more to come here on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back. We're chatting with Bob Lazar and Gene Huff about uh, Lazar's incredible journey uh, it, that ended him up with him working at a secret base in the Nevada desert. Uh, before the break, we were talking about Los Alamos. And for me, this was always a key to your story, Bob, is if you had worked at Los Alamos and we could prove it, that seemed to uh, it's not too much of a leap to suggest you could work in the Nevada desert at a similar kind of facility. And you were telling a story before the break about coincidentally running into Edward Teller, who was in Los Alamos, to give a lecture. And, you know, while people – there's a conversation underway right now on AboveTopSecret.com where they're uh, debating back and forth about your, the credibility of your story. And I saw a remark there the other day that I had to respond to saying, ah, oh, that's just like all these storytellers. They drop the name of somebody famous in it. But the fact is we've got the newspaper that shows you on the front of it and it says you're a physicist at Los Alamos. It's a story about how you'd put a jet engine in a Honda. And then we also have that same newspaper, as you mentioned, mentions that Edward Teller is there. He's the guy who ultimately helped you get a, a job at S4, right? Yeah, that's correct. And, you know, as you mentioned, I didn't request working at Area 51. I had no idea the place existed, and that really wasn't my aim. I was more interested in uh, nuclear weapon research or propulsion, yeah, anything with a high energy output is what always has fascinated me. It's why I've been into, it's why I've built jet engines and rockets and, you know, all kinds of strange contraptions. But uh, and in Los Alamos, I worked with the, their half-mile-long particle accelerator. But anything that operates at tremendous levels of energy or requires the control of huge amounts of energy is always what has interested me. And really, that's what I really relayed to Dr. Teller and was kind of hoping, you know, there might be something at Livermore Labs up in California, which is where, you know, he spent most of his time, uh, you know, that that might be up my alley. And uh, instead, he had something much more interesting. And uh, (laughs) that's where that job came about. Uh, I got a couple of text messages while we were on break, and if I may be so presumptuous, um, I think we need to explain that Los Alamos is a city about 100 miles or so from Albuquerque, New Mexico, Mexico, and uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory is located there, which is where they uh, invented the atomic bomb during World War II, and the advent of that uh, lab has just been um, the subject of a of a uh, drama series on TNT called Manhattan, which just got done with its uh, its first season. That, that's one thing. The other thing is uh, that Ed Teller, that you guys are referring to, is the late Dr. Edward Teller, who's a scientist of German descent, who was the head scientific consultant to the four or five presidents preceding George Bush. I, I want to, to clarify those things. I want to come back to Eugene on this. Is okay. that Bob's just telling us a story? He's got all these kinds of different interests, but some of them, you you would say, there's no way a guy like Bob could ever be hired to work at Area 51, S4 on secret, the most secret stuff in the world. I mean, as you note, he has an interest in jet engines. He likes machine guns. He liked for a time wild women. He flew a 
He flew a pirate crossing a, a, a skull and crossbone flag on his house when I first met him. Uh, he's the Bob, the photo guy. And there's, you know, when you put the, all that together, there's no way a guy like that could be hired to work out there in the Nevada desert, right? Tell me the story, the Bob that you know, why it makes sense that a guy with his eclectic interests could get into a program like that and and how it is that you fell into this whole series of events. Well, Bob is what I uh, term a comprehensive problem solver, a wide range of interests, a a uh, jack of many trades and master of many. And uh, so you know, we talked about this extensively it, it, because of the gravity, <laughs> not to make a pun of the situation out of S4, it, it wasn't necessarily an instance where you could just take applications from all the most notable scientists in their field in the entire world and say, you know, here, we need you to come work on this. There had to be people that you could manipulate, that you could keep quiet, that, that could, they probably wouldn't want someone who commanded such respect that they could simply go on the news and expose this and everyone would believe them. Uh, I think it's um, what we have learned through this whole ordeal is that no one can change the world. Uh, no one who works in a project like that is allowed to take, you know, they don't allow you to take proof home. You can't come home from work and go to a news station and go, oh, here, here's some uh, Element 115 and here's photos of aliens and photos of flying saucers. They'll never be allowed to do that. So even no matter who was in a program like that and what security clearance they had, no matter what knowledge they possessed or what they had to say, it would always be just their word when they did the expose. Uh, exposure of the entire subject, and, it, and it's up to the uh, public whether to believe them or not. Hey, uh, tell me the story of how you got to know Bob, uh, the photo guy, and how you met Gene, uh, John Lear, because, yeah. uh, you know, so many people believe John Lear is this crazy UFO guy. He's this Svengali in this whole thing, the puppet master who talked Bob into doing this stuff. It's clear that uh, that's where the story came from, not from actual experiences. Well, John is an award-winning pilot. I mean, he's the pilot of L-1011 jumbo jets and uh, is the son of Bill Lear, the man who invented the Lear jet and the 8-track tape player and, and many other things. And um, so while I was working as a real estate appraiser, I was watching uh, watching television, and there was a show on called On the Record, which was hosted by you, George Knapp. And uh, on there you had John Lear as a guest, and I remember... Uh, all the subjects Lear talked about, including that the uh, late comedian Jackie Gleason had a house in Florida that was shaped like a flying saucer, and that he was buddies with Richard Nixon, and, and they talked in depth on the subject. And um, so Bob and his wife were had the you know photo contract for developing photos for our appraisal office, and uh, Bob's ex-wife Tracy had told us that Bob worked at Los Alamos, and you know what a wide range of interest he had. And, and I told him about seeing this guy named John Lee on television, and Bob poo-pooed it and thought it was the stupidest thing he'd ever heard. So I called John Lee to see if he could give me further information, and he was, you know, pretty standoffish. And then when I told him I was a real estate appraiser, he had a, a good size estate uh, over in the east part of Las Vegas, and he cut a deal that I'd come over and appraise his estate, and in return he'd give us all kinds of UFO videos and documents and things he had amassed over the years. And uh, so I invited Bob to go with me, and Bob posed as my assistant <laughs> when we went and measured and photographed uh, Lear's house. And uh, and when we were in Lear's den, uh, I mentioned in passing that Bob was a scientist that worked at Los Alamos, and Lear was smoking his pipe and looking down at books and really treating us as excess baggage. And uh, then about the third time I brought up that Bob had worked at Los Alamos, John heard me, and of course then John's uh, interest perked up, and uh, the rest, and he's never uh, never stopped talking about Bob since that moment. I don't think. Um, Bob, you like John, uh, but you don't necessarily endorse everything he says. Uh, people, when people regard you and say that you are a creation of John Lear, what do you say to him? <laughs> That's insane. Huh. Now I do like John. John's a John's a good friend, but you know my my only complaint with John has always been one thing that he has no filter, and 
that he can get some in, and John collects a tremendous amount of information, and he has he's had contacts in the CIA. Well, he, he's worked for the CIA, and you know elsewhere in the world, and um, you know he amasses just a huge amount of information, and he may give the same credit to you know somebody that has verifiable connections in you know the intelligence community. Uh, with somebody that says they can see radio waves that lives next door to them. Um, you know, that's actually a uh, book and a novel have the exact same weight to John. Well, you were, you were, you liked John, but you were hostile to the UFO subject. As Gene said, you heard about that stuff on television and you thought it's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I really did. And, uh, you know, I thought John was crazy for believing all this stuff and, Considering who he was, he was an accomplished pilot, as Gene mentioned, and, uh, you know, had been around and, you know, certainly had contact with, uh, you know, people in the in- intelligence industry. And uh, it, uh, it it was mind-boggling that, that John Lear believed this UFO nonsense. And uh, anyway, he did have a lot of paperwork, which we looked at. But, you know, there again, it's impossible to determine if any of that stuff is real. Um, you know, fabricated or disinformation. That that time frame, 1989, I mean, a lot of stuff going on in the UFO world. The, the first UFO conference I ever went to, MUFON, was here in Las Vegas that year. Bill Moore, this guy, comes out and admits he was working as a disinformation agent, uh, working with AF, uh, the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. Everyone thinks the, the CIA is spying on them, which is probably true to some extent. And now, years later, a lot of people believe you were working for these guys. I, I, I looked at video that we posted on this uh, web link that I mentioned at the beginning of the program. When you did your polygraph exam for us, for the story, you were wearing a T-shirt that was the, had the CIA emblem on it. it was, I, I know that your oh, sense no of humor, kidding. you were just poking fun at, at it. But you hear that all the time. You're working for the government. I mean, address that idea that, that you worked for them to spread this story as some kind of a disinformation plot. Yeah, again, that's that's silly. And really, if that was the case, I'm owed an awful lot of back pay. But, um, <laughs> you know, in all seriousness, that's, uh, it, you, again, you'd have to know me on a personal level. I would never participate in something like that. Um, George, to what end? I, I When people say that, I wonder, what would they be hiding? Where would that be advantageous? to spread disinformation implying that we had hardware from a, another star system, from, you know, uh, another type of being in, in the universe. What, how could that benefit whatever they were actually trying to hide, and, and how could whatever they are trying to hide be more important than that? Well, right. I've heard them you know, say... We, we pretty much ahead. know everything that's going on at Area 51. They do a terrible job at keeping things quiet. Like, even when the stealth fighter was under development, most people knew what was going on. I mean, we know that they, you know, they have Russian fighters out there that they, you know, practice. Well, <laughs> they take yeah, apart, they, too. But, uh, yeah. you know, there's a... Uh, there's a whole host of things from new fighter development to uh, other weapon development. They've done some chemical warfare testing. I mean, what what in the world would that be useful for? Well, the, you know what the argument has been made is, well, it distracts attention away from something else that was secret going on out there. And since your story has come out, CIA has gotten a lot of mileage out of saying, oh, yeah, all those UFOs you were seeing, that was us. Uh, it was U-2. It was SR-71 planes, which looked nothing like flying saucers, by the way, but that was all us. And and they sort of poo-poo it, saying, uh, yeah, that's what we were doing, implying that your story came out to distract attention from something else going on out there, to which I say, if so, then somebody, it. yeah, it somebody had to be it. fired, because it focused more attention on Area 51 than anyone could possibly imagine. Even the Russians changed satellite orbits, right, since the story came out. So, I mean... Saying that that's to distract from something at Area 51 is ridiculous. It put Area 51 under the microscope by every person that had even a remote interest in it. Talk to me. Um, we got about six minutes, and we'll go to a break. Talk to me about your first day. We'll come back to the story about how you got hired and what you went through, but your first day going out there, do you remember it? Yeah. 
Of course. Uh, now, my first day going out to Area 51 to sign documents and security or my first day driving down in the bus to S4. Let's uh, let's go the first day of the, the bus trip. Okay, that was uh, – I had flown into Area 51, and um, we got on a, a bus, which was a, a Navy blue school bus type vehicle with the windows blacked out, not the front windshield. And we uh, drove about – what I estimated was about 10 to 15 miles south of Area 51. It was really kind of hard to judge distances and, and directions, but um, I'm convinced that's the direction we took. Um, and we came out to another large dry lake, which is Papoose Dry Lake bed, and – as we pulled up, there's a – it's not really a mountain, but it's, a, you know, a rise in a hill with a somewhat steep side to it. And as we pulled up there, you could see only when we got close that there were large hangar doors in the side of the mountain and that they had really been cleverly disguised with a, a sand texture painting on it or paint or what appeared to be a sand texture paint um, on the outside. So certainly from a distance, it would just look like the side of the mountain. Around the edge of that, there was another entrance in, and that was really the, the first time I had seen the installation there or even heard about it. There was no briefing telling me where I was going. It was just come with me and... Uh, that was uh, the guy that led me around was my immediate supervisor, Dennis Mariani, who we've talked about an awful lot. <clears throat> Just not yet. We'll get back to him in a moment. So is it the overall, is that your second time? You had one day when you came and signed the papers and all that stuff, and then the, the, this is your second time you know, going up to that facility? It's blurred together. I can't remember exactly what I did on the first day versus the second day because, you know, I was, <laughs> was tremendously excited uh, once I saw what was going on. Didn't you have and, to go into the nurse where you drank the stuff that tastes like pine smells and all of that medical stuff for, see, because you would be exposed to things out there you might not, you might be allergic to, things that aren't just found everywhere? Yeah, that was, uh, that was the, this first day when um, I had to have a somewhat abbreviated medical exam. And, uh, you know, that w- exactly what they told me was, you know, we're working with some pretty exotic materials here, and they were most interested in, you know, what I could, what I was potentially allergic to, or what I had known to be allergic to. They gave me a little grit on my arm, and did a pinprick test, which, you know, was an allergen test for some of the uh, materials I'd be exposed to there. But um, yeah, and I also, a lot of people have made a big deal about this. I drank some pine-smelling liquid and they uh you know but this it wasn't thorazine or wasn't some hallucinogen or anything like that it was uh like i said it was a, a it was a fairly rigorous medical exam but uh it was somewhat shortened uh because dennis really wanted me to see to to work. something what was going on when did they fingerprint you so you i know you had to put a thumbprint or fingerprint or whatever to get into the door, so they must have fingerprinted you at some point in time. To... Yeah, that was all done, you know, at Area 51. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, that's why I specified either going down there or to Area 51. Area 51, all the preliminary stuff was taken care of. Um, and then when we, you know, actually entered the place is when they had the uh, a hand reader and my badge. You put your hand... Uh, on it's a small plate with some pins on it that you could put between your fingers there's a bright light above it and it at that time it wasn't it wasn't anything exotic like a a fingerprint reader uh from what i understand it just measured the bones in your finger well it sounds pretty exotic to me i'd never heard of it before you told me it back back many years ago but that sounded kind of do they have those things now Uh, are they in use anywhere i've never heard of one or seen one after that and certainly you know, fingerprint scanners have 
you know, been all the rage since then. But I've never right. heard of anything that measured bones in your hand. But, uh, you know, it was just done with light. And, all right. Uh, well, you, you happen to see a lot more interesting technology than that, although that's pretty interesting. When we come back, we'll hear uh, what you saw in those hangars down there adjacent to Papoose Lake. Uh, much more to come here on Coast to Coast AM. Stay with us, everyone. I had mentioned to you that Area 51, that's that name of that base, had permeated throughout the popular culture. And this is an example. My producer, Chris Boros, dug up a whole long list of songs that are about Area 51 or themed about Area 51. That's one of them. A guy named Billy Thompson. Sounds like ZZ Top kind of it. You might have heard a reference in those lyrics to the Groom Lake Yacht Club, which they used to sell T-shirts, uh, Groom Lake Yacht Club T-shirts when uh, – when this story first broke, uh, there's some other story uh, songs that we'll be hearing uh, through the night uh, with an Area 51 theme. Uh, and uh, we'll also be talking about some other people who've come forward with their own tales about Area 51 of varying degrees of credibility, including uh, a guy named Boyd Bushman, who made a whole bunch of news a couple of weeks ago with his deathbed confession about things going on out there. We pick up our conversation with Bob Lazar and Gene Huff in just a moment here on Coast to Coast AM. All right, in just a moment, we're going to get into some details about what uh, Bob Lazar saw at this facility that uh, came to be known as S4. Uh, but I want to go back to something we touched on before the break, and it's about your memory, Bob. Uh, maybe, Gene, you can talk a little bit about it. People would say, how can Bob not remember X, Y, or Z? If he really was in this program, he should remember everything he did out there. Uh, do you suspect, based on the description Bob just gave us about this green liquid, uh, that maybe something was done to his memory. And can you address, as his friend, the general idea about how his mind works on everyday stuff? Well, um, now, I don't know that they tried to alter his memory, but remember, there are a lot of things we haven't covered here. Uh, the security checks, he, even when they, they indoctrinated him out of Area 51 and or down at S4, they were poking fingers in his chest, and armed guards would put guns to his head. All of this, you know, to remind him that he's taken this oath of secrecy. And so, you know, this this was to imprint his memory to to be afraid, to be afraid of them, and to not dare expose anything that he was, you know, told or exposed to out there. So, I would I so that would imprint his memory. But I don't know that that would alter his memory of day to day events. And remember. You know, he's not going to work work on computers. I mean, after he reached the briefings, I mean, this guy's working on flying saucers, that are flying discs that were brought in from another star system. It's pretty overwhelming. And and I remember when when things started getting nasty, when the when the uh, security briefings, when the threats to him started becoming more more uh, often and and more severe. I suggested that he start taking note of the names of the people that were doing this. He was so absorbed in the surroundings and the environment and the tests at hand, which were, you know, mind-boggling. I mean, uh, that, uh, you know, everyone had a badge on with their picture and their name, and I was the one to suggest that he start memorizing some of these people's names just in case he ever did need to remember who they were should things go really bad, which ultimately they did. Bob, do you think that they messed with your memory, that stuff that you drank? I mean, certainly they intimidated you, right? I don't think so. I don't know if the technology existed back then. Um, I don't know how much that technology exists today, at, you know, to selectively uh, affect memories. But, um, you know, I never experienced uh, any memory loss to any degree but, I mean, not, well, wait a second now, because you you would say that there were times when you'd fly up there. You didn't know when you got home. You didn't know what you'd done that day, didn't you? <laughs> well, that is true. But that's I mean, that's pretty much been that way my entire life. I mean, I don't know what I had for dinner last night, you know, so that's uh, I'm just not the best guy as far as memory goes. Address the the idea that I, I approached uh, uh, earlier before the, the break about why you would be a guy to be hired at a program like this, because you've heard it so many times over the years. Bob is not the kind of guy they would ever hire for this. He's too wild. He's uh, got no, unconventional exactly, beliefs. That's yeah. exactly what they were looking for, and they made that clear to me. I said, we really wanted somebody out in left field. We keep going over the same thing, and we keep getting the same results. 
and you know they mentioned Dr. Teller's recommendation. Uh, you know that this this is a guy that just might look at things differently, and I think they just they they, they wanted somebody to think outside the box. You and, think they also picked you because you could be discredited if things went awry? I'm I'm sure that was the case because I would, as I've always said, I'm an extremely easy guy to discredit. So yeah, I, if you look at all these things, who else would you pick, George? I, uh, go ahead. You know, Bob uh, says he can't remember things very well, and you say sometimes he wouldn't remember what he did at work that specific day. But on the whole, I mean, <laughs> he remembered the specifics of a wide range of information. I mean, think of all of the things this guy has brought forward back then, and of course, it's remained the same for the past 25 years. So while, you know, he might not think he's got immediate memory, I mean, don't you think he did a great job of remembering specifics about a wide range of information? Absolutely. What I was getting to is well, Bob's the kind of guy that... I'd like to clarify that. Sure. <laughs> say I couldn't remember what I did that day. And that wasn't to say that, you know, I got home and I don't remember anything. I mean, we're talking about specifics of what I specifically did that day. I guess um, the point I was making, Bob, is knowing you well enough after all these years is you're the kind of guy, I mean, I do the same thing. I'll dr- If I'm thinking about something, I'll drive by, right by my own house if my head is into something. Or, uh, I mean, your brain can be preoccupied and you don't remember the kinds of stuff that everybody else would think about, mundane, everyday stuff. Yeah, that's just me. And you really, you have to know me to know that. You know, it's kind of, as, as people have said it, um, you know, this guy is the typical absent-minded professor. So, Well, but if he's working on a flying saucer, can you blame him because he can't remember the name of the guy he was working with? You know, that's, you know, he's being confronted with technology from another star system. It's a matter of priority. You know what I mean? I don't think he was paying attention to things that were less important than that. Uh, let's go back to, I wish I hadn't jumped out of the order, but the first day you go up there, you get hired. The first day you go up there, you had to sign a bunch of papers. And uh, is that the first day you read the briefing book? Did you get a look at what was in the briefing book about all kinds of weird technology and where it came from, or has that come later? Well, that can't, that was down at, at um, that was actually down at S4. Now they gave me some other overall briefings, and it was mostly security at Area 51, you know, where that plane landed, Area 51 proper. And as Gene mentioned, you know, it was, it, was, it was mainly just hammering the security of the place, you know, into my head, how things go, where you go, what you do, and, you know, who you talk to. And, uh, you know, one of the main things they brought up with was, you know, if people keep asking you what you do up here, you know, what you tell them, you can make things up or, you know, tell them, hey, I just can't say. But if they push it more than three times, they want to know that person's name and how to contact them. So, you know, they were they were really concerned about the spread of information of any kind or even that I had any work to do up there or even had traveled up there. By the time you got hired, you already knew John Lear. It would seem to me they would go, aha, that's a flashpoint. There's no way we're hiring some guy who knows John Lear, the crazy UFO guy who's spreading all these stories. That alone would be a disqualifier. What do you say about that? Did they raise the issue of John Lear? Yeah, they actually mentioned John Lear's name. And actually, if I can step out of that question for a minute, um, Kathy Thomas, who you met, who worked at, um, oh, that Mo- what's the big uh, satellite installation in Mojave? Oh, yeah. The, uh, yeah. No, the, the great know. big dishes that, yeah, uh, that the VLA? yeah right. The, the VLA? Yeah, the VLA. It, 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 I think it's a, the Goldstone. Yes. Anyway, you knew her too, Jean, right? She yeah, recently, yeah. She she recently died. died, but what I'm getting at is, is, um, when she left Goldstone, she applied around, and she actually got a job at Area 51. And she used me as a reference on the form, which we thought was hilarious. You know, I said, Kathy, if there's ever been a person not to put on your application, it's me. But she got the job. So, you know, going back to talking or mentioning John Lear, um, you know, obviously – 
if you could put me as a reference on there and get into Area 51, uh, although I didn't use John as a reference, they had gone over every person I know uh, or knew at that time, friends, family, whatnot, and, you know, what they did, their relationships, so on and so forth. But, you know, obviously they weren't uh, that concerned about John. Well, or maybe they maybe they liked the idea that you knew. Gene, you were going to say? Well, I think uh, to just take one step back again to the um, security briefing to Area 51, I think it's important to note that he also, by executive order, signed his rights away to due process, that, that if anything went wrong, it would be handled by a civilian court-martial out there. And, he, and this, of course, it's supposed to be illegal to sign your civil rights away, but that was a requirement for him to get into this program was by the, I think, wasn't Ronald Reagan's signature on that, Bob? Yes, it was. Yeah, so he had to sign his right to due process away to, to work at this at this facility. Uh, the word magic or majestic, where did you first see that? Because, you know, as you know, that's a very controversial term in, in uh, ufology, whether a majestic 12 type organization really existed. Was that the name of it, or were they messing with you? No, that was, I mean, the MAJ was on my badge. Um, and I always thought that maybe I was stretching, but I always thought that that was a, an abbreviation for majestic. Um, and I know John Lear produced the, uh, uh, MJ 12 documents and showed me those. Now I don't, I don't really recall the history of that or, uh, or if that was the first instance of majestic or majestic 12 being mentioned, but um, I, I did believe, now I, I, I can't say for sure, I think I did question Barry, who was my co-worker at the time, and mentioned the MAJ on the badge. And I, just, I, I can't remember if he verified that it was short for Majestic or what his comment was on it. But, um, you know, I, I was always under the impression that that's, that's what it was. George, so does, you, the audience, does the audience ahead. know who the Majestic 12 are? In general, yeah, Majestic okay. Twelve is supposed to be this uh, all-powerful overlord, this panel of people who control access to all UFO information, crash saucers, things of that sort. Highly controversial, even in the world of ufology, about whether this panel really existed or not, uh, because the the source of the, the the documents that mention it that came forward, the uh, how they came forward is highly controversial to this day. Uh, let's go back to you, well, Bob. You know, on that same note, you know they. Uh, I, a lot of questions I get asked have to do with security, and one of them was, oh, you know, my grandfather had the highest security clearance, you know, in whatever force he was in, the Army, Navy, or Air Force, and, uh, you know, he would certainly have known about this. You know, you don't automatically get to know everything when you, you know, attain high security clearances. They're very specific, and one of the things I was told uh at that time, there were only 22 people who had knowledge and information about the whole extraterrestrial program, the fact that we had uh, recovered crafts there and, you know, the back engineering, the fact that Papoose. But th at that time, there were only 22 people, and, you know, they had us go over that list. That list was always, always available, and... You know, that's that's an incredibly small amount of people for such a, a mind-boggling project, and that's one thing that always you know, really shocked me. But they were so concerned about security and, you know, the potential leakage that they wanted to keep it as small as possible. Um, but in any case, that was, that was really all the people that, that knew about it at that time. Let's talk about compartmentalization a little bit. I, you know, since we broke work, worked on this story, I've got to know a lot of people who worked at Area 51, some who are still working out there, people who had been there in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, working on all kinds of different projects. And invariably they will say, Bob Lazar was never here. I never saw him at Area 51. That's number one. Uh, number two, uh, at the, the, if there had been a project like this, I would know about it. But in the same breath, they would tell me, I worked with a guy and every day saw him in the chow line for five years and I never knew what he worked with. Or they would tell me, I had to lie to my wife. I had to tell her something else. Um, we've seen uh, briefing documents and, and uh, pamphlets from out there 
uh, that they give to the workers that say, here's how you lie and here's how to make up a, a story about what you do. Yeah, that's true. That's that's true. That was that was part of the security information I got, too. And and as far as Area 51, I, I didn't work. I wasn't stationed at Area 51 proper. The only time I was there, you know, for any length of time was the first time. And I was in a, a single room. I wasn't, you know, hanging out there you know, mingling with people. When the plane landed, I went from the plane into a bus and drove south to um, S-4. And no one from Area 51 proper was allowed down at S-4. Um, so, yeah, I, if people worked at, at Area 51, um, we would never cross paths. I'd like to point this out, is that, uh, you know, you have you have critics, and it's understandable why you'd have critics uh, who argue about your credentials, your work history. He can't prove this. He can't prove that. The, the, but they have to overlook a lot of stuff to disregard your story, one of being the existence of a place called S-4. There had never been an S-4 on any maps. No one had ever printed it. There had been no re- news stories about it. It wasn't any newspaper accounts. It had never appeared in public until you said that there was a place called S-4. And I'll just tell the audience that I had called Nellis Air Force Base in 1989 to their public information office and asked them, do you have an S-4? And they came back and reluctantly, I think, told me, yes, it is a real place. Hmm. They said, we can't tell you where it is and we can't tell you what goes on there, but yes, we have S-4. In fact, we have more than one. Uh, Today, if you call uh, Nellis Air Force Base and ask them, and I did with our friend uh, Jeremy Corbell, we asked them, do you have S-4? Uh, Is there some place like that? They said, we can't find it on any map, which is not the same as saying it doesn't exist. It's just that it's not on a map, which is always been the case. But the fact that you knew about S-4, that it really was a a place that existed and nobody else had ever mentioned it before, and then Nellis confirms it, says, I think, says a lot. Well, and then the the skeptics go, well, that doesn't mean there were flying saucers there. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Well, let's let's talk about it. Let's talk about flying saucers. You went down, you get on the bus, you go down to this facility. It's built into the side of this slope designed to look like desert floor. And you go inside. The first day you're inside, did you see all these hangars? Did you see what was in them? No, actually, the we had been driving down around the side of the hangars, and there was, a, you know, for lack of a better term, an office entrance door that took you down the long corridor into the facility. And this one time I went down, we stopped at the hangar doors because one was open. And clearly in there was a flying disc. And as I've said before, this is, you know, the stereotypical flying saucer. It was very sleek looking. I gave it the name of the sport model later on because of the other units they had there. This was the sleekest looking and you know, most impressive as far as I was concerned. Um, and we came, we disembarked the bus at that point, and, and we walked directly through the hangar and with the express purpose of showing me what was in there. Now, when I walked in there, again, remember, I, I still am not buying into UFO stories, and I was convinced that I was right at this point, and I thought this was this fully explained why so many people thought they were flying saucers. I thought, oh, okay, this is our new advanced fighter. It looks like a flying saucer, so people think there are aliens and stuff flying around. I mean, all the pieces fit together. And, um, you know, even when I went by it, it had a little American flag stuck on it. And, you know, it all made perfect sense. For a while. Yeah, for a while. (laughs) Until I realized what we were up to. Wasn't the flag upside down? Yeah, it was. Which indicates what? Well, no, it wasn't upside down. It was backwards. Right, right. But that is not an indication that of uh, stress or... I have oh. no idea what that means. Oh, that's means. upside down, yeah. that the flag's backwards stuck on there. That uh... Um, We're going to a break in about a minute, so we got time to still tell the story about the posters. You saw these posters in these offices. What, what was on the posters? The poster was the craft I was talking about uh, flying just a little bit above Papoose Lake, and it said, they're here. And I, it was always, I was always amazed at that time. You know, at that time, there were no, uh, you know, right around when the Internet was new and, 
you know, there weren't any high quality poster printers like you can pick up now at, you know, Best Buy sort of, or large sort of format. Like, so these guys actually had somewhere had to have this stuff printed because they were regular like lithographed posters. They're here and a, and, a, and a picture of the sport model. Somebody's inside joke there. We'll come back and hear more of Bob Lazar's uh, astounding tale uh, right after this. The Flying Burrito Brothers singing about Area 51. Take us into the break. Keep on rocking in the free world. One of Neil Young's angriest, most sardonic, and most biting social commentaries. Neil, obviously not too happy with the way things were going back in 1989 when that story was released and uh, when that song was released. And I think the same could be said of Bob Lazar and Gene Huff because uh, things got pretty ugly for them and their immediate associates as well once Lazar started talking about the things he was seeing at the S4 facility in the Nevada desert. We're getting into the heart of the Lazar tale right after this on Coast to Coast AM. Moments ago, Bob Lazar was telling us about uh, being out at this facility called S4, seeing uh, what he later dubbed the sport model, uh, sitting there in a hangar, and uh, thinking to himself, well, that explains why we have so many UFO reports. It's because it's a secret program. It's uh, one of our jets designed to look like a uh, flying saucer. Bob, at what point did you realize we didn't make it? Um. Well, I guess the true confirmation came once I had hands-on with the technology. Um, you know, I did read uh, briefings, essentially overviews of what the project was. But, you know, even reading those, I, you know, I, I questioned what I was reading. That it was uh, maybe – it, it, this, is, this is astonishing stuff saying it's, it, this technology is from somewhere else, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that these were extraterrestrial craft. And, uh, you know, here's and the project of analyzing this device is split into several different project groups. I was one of them. And, uh, project you know, Leo, what was that? Project Galileo was the discs and uh, yes, sidekick, sidekick was looking the glass and sidekick, right? Yeah. What was, um, what was looking glass and what was sidekick? Sidekick was a weapon potential. And uh, uh, looking glass had to do with there was always a question, you know, if you can manipulate gravity, you can manipulate time. And, uh, you know, as it, that dealt with, you know, is this a reasonable thing to, to think about? Is the craft, you know, is it possible that it can affect time? And we're talking about, you know, milliseconds of time distortion, you know, or to seconds, not, you know, not traveling in time. So do you uh, think anyway, that there was... Uh, there were other groups of people out there who were working on those parts of the project? Right, right. And we were not permitted to talk, you know, between groups. We had uh, – each group was compartmentalized, and we had – it kind of worked on the buddy system. You know, you had your guy you can talk to about your project, and in, you know, rare circumstances there was crossover, you know, where you were shown, you know, perhaps uh, another component could possibly interface with what you were doing – so, you know, you had a supervised meeting, you know, with those guys, and they answered uh, specific questions about it. But they were so over the top with security and compartmentalization, it, it, it really neutered the whole project. I mean, things moved so slow because of that, and we could have gotten so much done so much faster if they had just been a little more open. We'll come back well, to that. I, oh, am I misremembering you. this or... Wasn't sidekick? Didn't you tell me that was a beam weapon focused with a gravity lens? Yes, that's exactly right. what it was. Um, so you're talking about security being omnipresent. You talked about the briefing documents when and how unbelievable this stuff was. Did you think that all this, the briefing documents included alien autopsy photos, uh, talking about zeta reticuli as being the source of this material or this technology? Did you think they were just messing with your head? Yeah, I thought that was a distinct possibility because there was so much of this information. It was so outlandish, and I, I had no idea really what, what they were trying to push here. So, you know, I digested what I could, and, you know, we continued on. This is very early in, you know, my introduction to what's going on. But when the day finally came um, that I, you know, met my my partner, Barry was his name, um, you know, and we, you know, at hands-on, he worked in the lab. He was anxious to show me where we were, what we were doing. And as we started going over, 
you know, some of the equipment that had been removed from the craft, it became immediately obvious that this is technology that not only didn't exist, that was so far advanced, it, it, was, it was borderline magic. And uh, that's when it hit me really like a sledgehammer of, you know, what we're really dealing with here and, uh, you know, rewrote my entire thought process about UFOs, extraterrestrials, and the technology involved with it. Well, let's talk about the technology, the magic. What was magical? Well, the number one thing is the control of gravity. Um, you know, we have, there's no machine that mankind has made at this point that can produce gravity. Like we can make an electromagnet, you energize it, and, you know, we can produce a magnetic field to pick up metal. We can, you know, uh, control most other forms of energy, you know, from, you know, lasers and light. We have machines that can accelerate particles uh, to near the speed of light. But the one thing, the one big gap we have is that we can't control this force known as gravity. And if we had a machine that you could turn on and make gravity or repel gravity, we could, the whole world of science fiction suddenly becomes fact. There, there would be force fields. There would be you know, movement in time, there would be propulsion without jets or propellers, uh, you know, silent field propulsion. And anyway, that being said, one of the first things he showed me was the operational power source in this vehicle, uh, removed from the vehicle, and that it produced its own gravitational field artificially. What did it look like? How did it work? It looked like, um, oh, about, the, well, the sphere, half a sphere, uh, about the size of a basketball on, uh, oh, I guess about an 18-inch square plate. So it was about the size of it, the overall shape. It um, was extremely efficient in that it didn't, and, you know, like this is in violation of one of the laws of thermodynamics. Any, any system has to produce waste heat to some degree, but this did not. And the entire system operated like a, I, as I said before, a perfectly tuned ballet. Uh, there was no waste. This was a small accelerator that used an exotic element that we hadn't seen before. <clears throat> that produced and focused gravitational waves and transmitted them through the craft uh, much the same way as that we route microwaves through tuned pipes. Um, you know, this is all shocking technology and, you know, something that just didn't exist. So this, this was a reactor, the power source that had been taken out of the one of the craft and it was sitting there in, in your workspace and... And this guy, Barry, was showing you how it worked. Yeah, he, he energized it. Um, the reactor flip- actually powered uh, the, the gravity generators and the emitters, but the reactor itself produced its own gravitational wave almost as a byproduct. But with the device running, you could not put your hand on it. And that was, you know, the moment where... It became, you know, all became real to me because that's that's physically impossible. Uh, How did he demonstrate that to you? With the golf ball? With the yeah, ball. the golf ball. But, uh, you know, to get the feeling, it felt exactly like if you ever take two large magnets with like poles and try and, you know, push them together. It's kind of a little rebound, um, and it becomes more difficult the closer the magnet gets to it. But that was occurring with my hand against this device so it was uh it was it was really shocking and to show me that the field was elastic to some degree uh you know barry took a golf ball and threw it at it and it rebounded off the field and knocked the ceiling tile out and we were both in temporary panic 
to get the ceiling tile replaced before security came by and saw that we were, you know, goofing around. But um, in any case, that was uh, that was the device and the moment where everything changed in my mind. There's a story you've told me and and told Jean before about a an experiment or a demonstration with a flame that that really cemented it. Uh, I think the audience would like to hear that one. Yeah, this still really makes no sense to me, and you know, and I had witnessed it. Um, the gravity, the reactor itself, um, indirectly connects to the emitters, which are these large, three large tubes essentially that hang underneath the craft, and that's what focuses and disperses the gravity waves. Anyway, again, one of those was also removed from the craft connected to the reactor, and Barry lit a candle, and it was sitting there flickering, and at the focal point of the tube, the gravity emitter, he again fired up the reactor, and the flame froze. Now, it continued to emit light, but it wasn't flickering anymore. It was essentially frozen in time like there was a picture of it, and what's always confused me is you shouldn't be able to see it because it really did freeze in time um, through the action of gravity that photons should stop being emitted and you know you wouldn't see the candle anymore much less the area around it but um, it was just a frozen flame just sitting there and that was it was mind-boggling so you shifted out of time is that what it was yeah that's a, a, a essentially how I've described it and in fact, he went one step further, and I think as I mentioned that, he turned up the power in the emitter, to, and we took the candle out, and he made a little black area where the, there was the light was bent away from it, just a small little sphere looking like you know a two-dimensional disk, but um, where he could actually bend light. Now gravity's the only thing that can do that. So you know here was a working device. Uh, or system, really, because it consisted of several parts, where you can artificially produce focus and control gravity, which gives you an amazing propulsion system. And gravity and time are, you know, very closely intertwined. So, uh, you know, it really allows you to do things that only exist in science fiction movies. Well, you've heard that since, Bob, is that when this, you know, when some of the details were released, you have scientists who will say, you know, they'll think about it and say, well, you know, gosh, that kind of makes sense. But most of them would say, ah, oh, that's ridiculous. It goes against the law of thermodynamics or whatever. I mean, you understand why people would have trouble with this. Yeah, these are, these are the comments that I made when I saw it. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, you have some guys that, oh, boy, you missed this and. Uh, no, I didn't miss any of that. All of that became, you know, incredibly obvious that this was violating. Look, these aren't theories. Some of the things, you know, we call laws are pretty much proven through, you know, experiments and through time that, look, we can call this a law because it's just impossible, you know, to break this, this law of nature or of physics. And, you know, it's it's a big deal when one of those things is being violated. <laughs> um, so tell me, you, you mentioned later that there are nine of these discs, nine hangers, nine discs, which you described as the variety pack. How did you get to know that? Did you get to wander around and see them? Now, as we were going out to see, to go into the disc, um, the hangers have large bay doors all between them. And they were all open, and you could see down into all the other hangers. And every hanger had a disc in it. Each one was different. Um, and in fact, one of them was standing up on its side and had a large hole in it, uh, like they had shot a projectile through it. Um, but like I said, the uh, now I don't know the story on the other discs. I was only permitted to work and have knowledge about this one. Uh, and like I said, it was the sleekest of them all, which is why I gave it the you know, nickname, the sport model. Um, but, yeah, there were nine discs in all, uh, and this 
um, from what I was told, had a power system and propulsion system that was common to all of them. And that's about all the knowledge I have about the other discs. You got to see the sport model in action. Yeah, I got to walk in it, see it in action, and take it apart. So I was pretty intimately involved with it. Um, one of the what test was flights. The, what was the nail in the coffin of of who had been flying this thing? Uh, you haven't explained yet when you first entered the sport model what you saw. Well, the reason they were leading me inside was, again, you know, we were involved with the power and propulsion of the craft. And in case the location of these components is critical to the understanding or duplication of the technology, uh, it was important I see where they went, where they were removed from. So that's why I was being led uh, into the craft. And when I went in there, it was extremely sparse. And there were three small seats in there. You know, it looked like they were, uh, you know, part of a tea set for, for a little kid. Uh, you know, those little tables and, and chairs. But they, I, I mean, very small. You would think if, uh, you know, a humanoid creature would sit in something like that. He'd have to be about uh, three and a half or four feet tall. So obviously the craft was made for something small. And, you know, that was uh, obvious was trying to get in the thing, too. It wasn't comfortable to stand in. You made the remark to me, Bob, in our first uh, interview. You said uh, it had small furniture. Yeah, I use the word furniture because I – you know, that we was, were being, I was being right. interviewed for the first time there, and I could not think of the word seats. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just, and I was also so concerned about saying this stuff on the air, I was just paralyzed. That was just, you know, a senior moment at the time. But, uh, yeah, that's why I called it furniture. He said it looked like it was made for a toddler when he first told me. That's how small they were. Yeah, yeah, un- unusually small, like a little kid's uh, place. Well. We can read into that what we will, uh, but you uh, got to see a test. In addition to walking into this craft, you got to see a test, right? Yeah, I, it, apparently it wasn't scheduled that way because Barry and I were working in the lab and Dennis, kind of the overall supervisor from what I've ever been able to ascertain, uh, came in and said, um, come on, Bob, there's a, a test in progress. And uh, he took me out of the lab We went down into the hangar, and the craft was already outside the hangar. I don't know how they got it there, whether they dragged it, rode it, or flew it out there. But it was already sitting on the ground right outside the hangar door, and they were in communication with it with what appeared to me to be an ordinary radio, ordinary VHF radio. And again, this caused a question in my mind because... If this thing is producing an enveloping gravitational field, it's going to bend and distort the radio waves to it. So how are they going to talk to anybody in the craft? But obviously they were. So, you know, there's there's things I don't know about communication with the craft. Um, but in either case, the craft slowly lifted off the ground. It had a, a some purple-blue corona discharge on the bottom Not very bright, but it was uh, noticeable, like you would see around high-voltage systems or Tesla coils. Um, That produced a a hiss, and as it lifted about four or five feet off the ground, that dissipated, and it just stood there motionless in the air, which was incredibly impressive for something large and silent to be sitting there. It moved over to the left and to the right, and sat back down. That was the extent of the test. But it was very, very impressive. So it didn't, like, you didn't get into it and fly to Venus in the blink of an eye, and uh, there there weren't aliens sitting in it uh, um, who welcomed you into the craft? No, it was retrofitted for a a human pilot, and it was a very short test. And, you know, this is a prized possession. They're not not taking this out and joyriding it. you know, or doing anything where they would, uh, you know, potentially lose or damage it. Although I was just kidding about ice. it. Hmm? I mean, but you, it could have gone to Venus. It could have gone anywhere. Oh, it could have gone much further than that. Yeah. 
Um, so, I mean, uh, unlimited pa- capability. If, if you can bend, uh, be- well, I'll tell you what, the music tells us we're going to a break. So we'll continue our conversation about the capabilities of this amazing technology. We'll get into the power source, Element 115, and then bring Gene Huff back into the conversation to talk about how the story broke and how your lives were changed forever and threats and all sorts of weird stuff going on. Stay with us. Rock set takes us into the break on Coast to Coast AM. Man, that song just cracks me up every time I hear it. Uh, the Bob Lazar song. I think it's a one-man band, a guy named Arthur Unknown, and he's got a music video he produced that goes with it. We posted it on the Coast website if you want to take a look at it. That's a lot of fun. It's one of dozens of songs that have been written about Area 51 since Bob's story came out. Coming up in this hour, we're going to talk a little bit about Element 115, which Bob says powers these uh, these craft. Uh, we'll talk about why he went public with this story, how it uh, led to death threats and all kinds of trouble for he and friends like uh, Gene Huff. And then we might have a surprise guest call in to join the conversation. Much, much more to come here on Coast to Coast AM. Well, we're into the heart of the story right now. And Gene Huff, I'm going to jump out of order. We'll come back to Bob and Element 115 in a moment. Bob just described before the break seeing this uh, test flight of the sport model over off of Papoose Lake, and it flew up a couple of feet. You also saw a test flight of what appeared to have been uh, the sport model. It was from a long way away. Actually, you saw a couple of them jumping out of chronological order. Tell me about the experience of being out in the desert with Bob after he had told you about these test flights and you seeing one for yourself. Well, Bob uh, took uh, me and uh, his ex-wife, Tracy, and who else the first time? I guess um, John well, Lear. Um, John Lear. Well, John Lear, right? Yeah. So yeah, we went out there in John Lear's RV, and uh, Bob knew that the test flights were supposed to, ha- supposed to happen just after dark, uh, on Wednesday nights because it's in the middle of the week in the middle of nowhere and just basic logic dictates that there wouldn't you wouldn't have problems with any onlookers and we went out there and shortly after dark we were scanning the mountainside and suddenly a light popped up above the mountain range and just sat still and um, I told Bob <laughs> that uh, I thought that Bob that light just popped up there and he said he thought it was the planet Sirius. And he had binoculars. He was looking around the other way. Planet and Sirius. <laughs> or the star. And, excuse me, the star Sirius. <laughs> okay. And, um, then he, and then he looked another direction. I said, hey, Bob, Sirius just jumped about five miles to the right. And he looked up, and that's when we started seeing the this disc actually go through its motions of step moves up in the sky. It would stop and blow a little brightly and then jump to another location. And, and on the night we saw it, got the best look at it. It, it was actually coming down uh, the Groom mountain range toward us. And it was a strange, uh, it was a strange, a peculiar mode of travel to your brain. We're used to seeing cars on a highway or trains on a railroad track or whatever the, you know, a light or an object in, at a certain speed uh, moving toward us. And I guess our brain triangulates that and calculates how far we are from it and whether we're safe or not. Well, with a, a flying disc, it, it doesn't travel in a linear mode like that. You'd be looking at it, and you blink, and then suddenly it's a few miles closer to you. And then without noticing it happening again, suddenly it's closer to you yet, and then you blink again, and it, it jumps. And, and this is alarming to your mind's eye because you didn't see it travel towards you, but suddenly it's upon you. And uh, then it, it got so close one time, it, it, it glowed. And Bob can explain why it does this, but it glowed very brightly. So it, to us, it looked like it was going to explode. We backed up behind the trunk lid of the car, and then it glowed back down and, and flew back over, back down around the mountain range and uh, went back behind the mountain and hovered for a minute and just popped down just like it popped up. And, I should point out there, was, there were trips out there, three of these trips, three weeks in a row. Uh, in which uh, multiple witnesses saw these these things flying out there. You recorded some video, and I mentioned that at the beginning of the show program. We're trying to post something that's an enhancement of that. But, Gene, for you, you're Bob's friend. You've got to know him really well. Some really strange stuff had happened to the two of you uh, that we'll get into later. But at some point you had to be wondering, is this guy telling me the truth? And then he takes you out in the desert, and lo and behold, there's a test of a, what looks like a saucer right in the spot where he said it would be. 
Well, he's not much of a joker. I didn't really suspect that he was lying prior to that, but of course you want to see some proof. In fact, I was telling him after I found out that he was in the program, what he was doing, I started reading all kinds of UFO information, you know, about the Roswell crash in the 40s and the Russian sightings in the 50s and all these things. And I said, uh, you know, I just, you know, if all that was happening then, then there must be something going on somewhere right now, and that's where I want to be. And he said, what are you doing on Wednesday night? <laughs> And you, I mean, but wow, seeing it and having it confirmed, it must have been sort of like Bob's moment of clarity when it all comes crashing down on his head. Oh my gosh, this is real. Yeah, yeah it was exhilarating to, to me. I mean, I just, uh, I was fortunate enough to see a craft from another star, star system fly right out here in Southern Nevada. It was, uh, it was an important Moment of my life, probably second to the birth of my son, one of the most important moments of my life. Well, it sort of goes back to what I was hinting at at the beginning of the program. You know, Bob takes so much grief from ufologists and people outside of ufology. Well, where did he work and where did he go to school? And for me, the you know, it's a matter of keeping your eye on the ball. Is the the key for me is is there are there flying saucers out there being tested in the desert? And that's the central question. And it seems to me that Bob knew a heck of a lot of stuff that he should not have known if he hadn't been out there. He knew about uh, the the test flights, when they would occur, where they would occur. He knew about the existence of a place called S-4 that had never been made public, some things we haven't got into. He knew about an agency called the OFI, Office of Federal Investigation, which did the background check on him. He knew about the name of the man who came to do the background check, a guy named Mike Thigpen, who we believe right. is still alive. All that was real, and you... You have to wonder, well, how did he know it if he wasn't in the program? Uh, Bob, I want to go back to – did you want to say something there? Well, I just wanted to say – and, and it, you know, some people don't even think Bob worked at Area 51 or S-4. So the, and Mike Sigpen of the OFI, which is the Office of Federal Investigation, which is the Office of Personnel Management out of Pennsylvania, what was Mike Sigpen doing at Bob's house? He was witnessed there by Shelley Ball, I think, and certainly by Tracy, Bob's ex-wife. They saw this man and another man come, you know, go through Bob's papers and belongings and, you know, his entire house just to see what he's got and what he's up to. Now, if Bob wasn't in a secret project, what were these guys doing coming to his house in the middle of the night? Let's go back to uh, the technology and the power source, Element 115. At the time that, uh, Bob, you first told me this story and told it to others, Element 115 did not exist. It exists now. Uh, it's been synthesized in a different form. Tell me about what this stuff is, what its physical properties are, and why you think it came from somewhere else. Well, it's a super heavy element. Um, and by that I mean, you know, on the periodic chart of the elements, um, uranium is about the you know, 92 on the periodic chart is, is about the highest you can naturally find. Now there are for nitpickers, there are trace amounts of plutonium that have been found in the Earth's crust, you know, formed by natural nuclear reactors. But, um, you know, for the most part, that's everything higher than that has to be synthesized. Now, it's not like we can make quantities of this stuff. We just make a few atoms and, you know, accelerators or, uh, not or, that's about the only way to make them, uh, just a just enough atoms to verify their existence and see how long uh, their half-lives are. So when there is a large quantity, you know, a measurable quantity of a super heavy element, uh, way higher than anything that we've uh, synthesized, uh, you know, you have to question its origins. Now, this is, was apparently the fuel that was part of the, uh, you know, that powered the reactor, part of an alien craft. So, um, yeah, is it possible that they have some advanced technology to synthesize it? Probably, but more likely um, where they're from has uh, naturally occurring heavy elements. Now, I don't know that for a fact, but it's not impossible. The star system they come from is a binary star system, and, you know, different chemistry might have taken place there. But in either case, um, we identified the element uh, as best we could to uh, point to element 115. You know, 
we used various methods from neutron activation and you know a atomic absorption spectroscopy and uh, atomic uh, fluorescence spectroscopy and you know it uh, again it was something that we had never seen before that apparently had some uh, amazing properties to it that when it operated in the reactor it produced a gravitational field uh, due to actions in that uh, reactor so the gravitational field is focused and channeled through waveguides, much like microwaves are, and these are folded around the craft and rooted down to the amplifiers and emitters down below, which is how the craft is powered. Now, unlike all the flying machines <laughs> that humans have made, uh, they all work under the action-reaction principle. In other words, a rocket or a jet or an airplane always takes gas, either air or combustion products, and accelerates it out the back of the craft, which pushes it forward. The way the disks work is they take and focus a gravitational distortion in front of the craft, and the craft essentially falls forward. That's a weird thing to envision, but what uh, an easy way, my analogy is if you put a bowling ball in the middle of your bed and then a foot in front of it, you push down with your fist, the bowling ball rolls towards your fist. That's how the crafts operate, which is really unusual compared to the way we're used to powering things. It's kind of an unstable flight in the low power mode, which is essentially, you know, flowing, flying around at low speed. In space, it operates in a different fashion, but still using uh, the gravitational propulsion. Um, so if you're an alien and you're on a planet uh, circling one of the Zeta Reticuli stars and you want to go to Earth, you point this thing at Earth and sort of pull it toward you. Kind of. You, you bend space with it. In... Um, and the, the two different modes were called Omicron and uh, Delta configurations. In Omicron mode, it uses one of the gravity amplifiers uh, to create a small distortion from the craft, and it moves forward at low speed. In Delta mode, the craft faces its belly toward the destination. All three amplifiers come to power, and they uh, converge on a point. Now, it can only go so far. I don't know how far each jump is. But um, it's a tremendous distance. That point is essentially pulled to the craft, and it snaps virtually instantaneously. Because remember, we're dealing with gravitational propulsion, and gravity and time are intertwined. So virtually no time passes, and it's flying outside normal space. It's uh, you know, it's something that's not easy to conceive at all. But this is, in fact, how the craft operates. Now, it does these... There is a recycle time on the on the generators. It can't, uh, you know, do it make make these jumps instantaneously, but it has to make several of them to go to any uh, great distance. Uh, obviously, there's great weapons potential for Element 115. Uh, you know, if uh, you had told me about it the first time we talked, if you wanted to make a bomb out of this stuff, it'd be one heck of a bomb because it's like a total annihilation reaction. Yeah, exactly. The weapon potential of the craft, you know, a lot of people say, well, uh, let's just assume all this stuff is true. Why in the world do they keep this stuff, you know, quiet? Why is it so secret? I mean, it, it almost always comes down to weapon potential. Now, I don't know if that's the only reason, you know, people aren't going to panic and start running in the streets if you tell them that we've had, uh, you know, Aliens. proof for contact, you know, with alien technology. Uh, they might get pissed off that you've been lying to them for 50 years about it. But, you know, nobody trusts the government anymore anyway. But, uh, you know, when it comes to weapons, you know, we we really love our weapons when it comes to the United States. And uh, that has some incredible potential, not just explosive power, but as Gene mentioned at the start of the show, um, you know, if you control gravity, you can 
you can manipulate the flow of particles and you know things like beam weapons that can be focused and uh, things that are just kind of out of the reach of our technology uh, can really be brought under control using you know some of this technology. So uh, with, what, go ahead, Gene. Uh, with the uh, with the propulsion method you just described. So my description before of how the the disc would appear to jump toward us and then jump further toward us. I guess it was creating a divot in front of it, and then it would slide into that divot and then create another one. And these were the, what I perceived as jumps toward my, toward you, from my point of view. Yeah, that's exactly what you saw. I mean, you're probably one of the few people on the planet that actually saw exactly what I was talking about firsthand. Okay. At, at one point, Bob, you had a piece of this stuff, and the assumption has always been by people who follow the story, well, you must have stolen it from work, and uh, they have a lot of trouble with it for a variety of reasons. Uh, uh, you had said the, the, when they use a slice of it, like a pizza, a little mini pizza-shaped piece of it into the reactor, um, that, that that's how it works and that they had 500 pounds of it. But at some point, you, had, you did have a piece of it outside of work. Uh, can you describe um, – and, and one reason I know about it is because I was there one night when you did a test with it. I personally saw it. Can you describe uh, how you got it, or can you get into details? You didn't steal it, did you? You know, I'm just not going to yeah. touch on that subject there. Well, you did have a you, – can you confirm you had a piece of it? You don't want to get into that either. No, why would I want to do that? All right. Um, it doesn't behave how – how you predict that it would behave, the kind of 115 that's been synthesized, right? The one I think he's getting around to it's an isotope. Oh, 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 okay. Yeah. Oh, the 115 that, that yeah, we Yeah, that's made. been created in a lab by humans, yeah. yes. Yeah, it's certainly 115, um, but yes, it doesn't behave like the uh, material in the craft. It's, you know, it's an isotope of, of 115. Look, there's, uh, the, you know, elements have isotopes, they're still the same element. For instance, hydrogen. Uh, we're all familiar with hydrogen. It's a uh, lighter than air gas. It's flammable. Um, hydrogen has three isotopes, uh, deuterium and tritium. One of them is radioactive and has a, you know, a, well, I can't remember, a 12 and a half year half-life, something like that. Deuterium is stable and protium, which is regular hydrogen, is also stable. Um, now, the isotope they made um, you know, I, I don't recall what the half-life was on it, but, um, you know, there again, it's an, it's an isotope of 115. If they continue experimenting, I'm sure they'll come up with other isotopes and inevitably, you know, also produce the stable isotope that was uh, in powering the craft. Now, again, you know, they're producing atoms of it, so there's no chance they're going to produce a measurable quantity where they can start playing with this material in a useful manner, they'll just be able to identify some of the properties of it. So I don't really know where that research is going to go other than one day they'll say, you know, hey, we have a, a stable super heavy element here. I mean, when you think about what you could do with an operating disc that can perform in the way that you describe, I mean, the military potential is beyond anything. It makes you wonder what they might be doing with it. You know, you are they using it? The world single-handedly with an operating disc first of all because it's a you know it's a gravity distorted field around it you it can't be uh, affected by projectiles or explosions i mean which is the basis of our our weapons so there is it's essentially invulnerable and now it, there could be electromagnetic means of disabling the craft i don't know how you know one would stop one from working but um you know you can shoot it out at all day long with tanks or drop bombs on it, it's, it, it's just not, not going to be effective. So, yeah, weapon potential, it's staggering. And, you know, our goal was essentially to see, can we duplicate this technology with the materials we have available to us? And at the time, the answer was a resounding no. Uh, 25 years have gone by. I don't know what progress they've made or where they're doing this anymore, but... Um, I, I really don't know what the answer is today. But I guess the fact is, if you were to use it in a military sense, you would reveal its existence, and uh, clearly they've, they'll show no interest in that. The other questions it raises is, if aliens have this technology, you can imagine what they could do to us if they wanted to. 
Uh, we're going to take a short break uh, with uh, R.E.M., A Stand is the name of the song. It brings us back to 1989. And when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the terrible consequences for Bob and Gene on a personal level once this story broke. Much more to come on Coast to Coast AM. That's a great song from 1989, gravel-voiced rock survivor Joe Cocker, When the Night Comes is the name of the tune. We were hoping to surprise uh, you listeners with a visit from John Lear. Uh, John is uh, a critical part of this story, a uh, crucial role he played in the Bob Lazar tale being made public. And, you know, we we joke with John, and uh, when I say crazy John Lear, I'm using air quotes because there are people in the public who don't buy any of this UFO stuff or any of John's stuff. But I can tell you, I owe John such a debt of gratitude because when I first started chasing the UFO story and uh, some of the Area 51 stuff, John was so gracious in sharing with me all of his files and material and explaining uh, the who, what, and when and where of ufology. And it's a it's a bizarre world with its own rules, and John helped me navigate it, and I, I, I can never repay him for that. And he got to know uh, Bob Lazar and Gene Huff pretty well. It's a sometimes contentious relationship. The public has no idea how all those pieces fit together, fit together but uh, – John has been really important to this story. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, John Lear and the personal uh, sacrifices that all of these guys made because they were daunting and there was intimidation and threats and some pretty nasty stuff that happened. And we're going to get into that when we come back here on Coast to Coast AM. Uh, We're back with uh, Bob Lazar and Gene Huff. Gene, I want to ask you about John Lear. Uh, You know, there's a perception by people who don't want to believe this whole story that John Lear must have cooked it all up, that you guys went along with it and are having a chuckle at the public's expense and you all speak with one voice. And and I just have to laugh at it. I mean, you've gone round and round with John uh, yourself, but in general, I think you, you agree he plays a key role in this whole story and how things unfolded. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, if there's one thing Bob Lazar loves to do, it's to rain on people's parade about their misperceptions about everything. You could tell Bob your name, and he could explain why your name was wrong. And so, and nobody says more more debatable things than John Lear. I mean, John throws some crazy things out there, but the bottom line is that when we met John Lear, John Lear said that there had been life here from elsewhere. The American government knew about it and was hiding it. And, of course, that it has been around since antiquity. And in and, and the past 25 years, I've read literally tens of thousands of pages of research. And the bottom line is John Lear was right. Life has been here. All, and, in fact, it's so much easier to determine a, a UFO sighting in antiquity, as you pointed out before, with the, you know, the U-2, the stealth fighter and bomber, the SR-71, Nowadays, there are definitely anomalies in the sky uh, that you might, you know, not be able to distinguish between a UFO and and, and just what just a, a flying object that you don't know or, or, or an alien spacecraft. But 500 years ago, there was nothing metal flying around in the sky, so it was easy to determine, you know, a, a, a something that was not from around here back then. But the bottom line is, Lear did say there was. Life here from elsewhere, the government knew it, they hit it, and that was true. Now, he might say some other outrageous things, but the bottom line is what John asserted has proven to be true and is, has been accepted all the way up until, as you well know, the year before last, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the uh, Apollo, uh, Apollo astronaut and the sixth man to walk on the moon, went public and declared that he's 90% certain that life from elsewhere has been here and that the American government knows about it and has covered it up. And he knows this in his travels around the world from lay people as well as from contacts who have worked at the Pentagon in the past and still work at the Pentagon now and save 10 percent for the fact that maybe the whole world is playing a joke on him. But but this is a big revelation. This isn't some UFO nut you could just poo-poo. This man has degrees in aeronautics and astronautics. He's an American hero, and uh, he says he's 90 percent sure this is real. Uh, Bob, same sort of question to you about John. Uh, Let me ask it a different way. Why did you tell him what was going on, what you were working on? I mean, you you said that when you had your first contacts with him, you told him you thought this whole UFO stuff was baloney. You didn't believe a bit of it. 
And then you find yourself in the unenviable position of finding out at least some of it really is real. And yet, and you decided to tell John Lear about it and, and Gene and others. Well, I, it, John Lear it was mainly because, you know, at the, at the time, it looked like this guy had spent his life researching this. I mean, all the files he had and, I mean, he knew every bit of information that can be had from all different sources and was trying so desperately to put this together. And, like, he even told me what, you know, was essentially true, as Gene, as Gene mentioned. I, it, it's just like I wanted to confirm, you know, with him, just, look, this, this is what you thought. Now, now... And as Gene also mentioned, you know, John has a lot of other beliefs that, you know, I don't agree with. You know, for instance, he thinks people live inside the sun, among other, you know, bizarre things, you know, which to me is just silly nonsense. But the the thing is that, uh, you know, when we first met John, uh, he did have a surprising amount of information that, you know, according to what I was exposed to, uh, you know, was correct. So at some point, John did run into somebody who actually had some real information. We've talked to John on the air before. It's been a while, but uh, and we wish him well. We, as we all know, in the, in our group, well, John's got some health issues that he's been battling, and we had hoped he'd join us tonight, but we certainly understand why he wasn't up to it. But uh, there came a time when you told him about this stuff, and you told Gene, and you told others. And, and I want to know, sort of walk us through that process, what the reasons were. I know public statements you made before is that security out there was omnipresent, just over the top. You felt that they were sort of squandering the opportunity, not making enough progress. And uh, you also felt threatened. I mean, John made some real sacrifices to pursue this line of truth. So did you. Yeah. Um, you know, as as time went on, uh, I was there for a short while, and uh, because of what was going on at the project, they really wanted me up to speed as quickly as possible. And, uh, you know, boy, the story is kind of long, but to, to make it a shorter, when I fell out of favor with them, um, I began to be a little concerned. They wanted to review my security clearance, and I stopped getting called into work. And at this time, I began to worry that, boy, they're not just going to let somebody like me, after everything they've told me, uh, you know, just go back on with my life. Um, you know, I, I really began to wonder if I was safe or not. And I had been... You know, I had several friends in the Las Vegas area, and, you know, I'm sure at that time from their perception, things were strange with me. I couldn't talk about much. You know, I disappear at strange hours and stuff like that. And what I wanted to do in case something unusual did happen to me, I just wanted these guys at least to know what was going on, what I was involved in. And since I had the test flight schedule, um, you know, virtually all the tests of the sport model, uh, that's when I decided, you know, to tell Jean, John, my wife, what was going on. And, you know, her sister, I think, was the one other person that came with us. Oh, Jim Taliani. Jim Taliani. Friend. Yeah. And, um, you know, and you know, take them down on one of the nights when I knew the test flights were taking place. And, uh, you know, to show them what was going on, what I was involved in, and say, look, if I suddenly disappear or something happens to me, just so you guys know, this is what was going on. So that was really the impetus for, you know, letting everybody know. Uh, John Lear was kind of a slightly different one. It was because, you know, I just wanted to tell the guy that all his work wasn't in vain, that, you know, there really was something like that going on at the test site. It's one of the parts that I think is most important about the story, and yet it's the hardest to tell. The kinds of things that were going on in, in your lives and mine, being followed around, people listening to the phones, following you wherever you go, threats. I mean, um, it's hard to convey that, Gene, uh, but it's real and it happened. And it's a, 
And in fact, the reason that Bob, the things came tumbling down for him was a very personal and painful reason. It's not the kind of thing you'd like to make up if you're making up a UFO story. So you want me to say what it is? Is that what if you, you want? want? Sure. <laughs> well, uh, when Bob was in the program and they were doing all the security checks, they had his phone tapped and they were listening on his phone. Well, as bad luck would have it, Bob's wife was having an extramarital affair. And, of course, Bob didn't know it, but the guys listening on his phone line did because they would hear her talking with whomever she was associated with. So they knew that they that sooner or later when he found out he was going to be emotionally distraught and and, and, of course, you have to be emotionally balanced, psychologically balanced to have that security clearance. And so they knew that this is what he was going to be up against. And um, so finally his wife told him, and, uh, and uh, I even think that, I don't know, maybe Bob can straighten us out on this. I don't even know if maybe the when we were taken out there to see the, test of the disc. I, he took his wife out there just as, I don't know, to impress her or to reclaim her or whatever. I, I, I was a pretty new friend of Bob's at the time. He had other much older friends he knew much better, and I, I felt fortunate. I was thankful to be included in the crew that got taken out there to see the disc test. But anyway, long story short, she uh, she eventually told Bob, and after they heard uh, on the phone, she had called her mother and told her mother that she had told Bob, and now they knew that Bob knew. And so when Bob, uh, I guess one thing we haven't said yet is, is one of the nights we went out there to see the disc test, um, we had been oh. pulled over by the Wacken hot guards out there, the security guys. And when we knew that was going to happen, Bob got out of the car and went running across the desert because he didn't want to get caught out there with us. And and so they stopped us and checked our IDs and asked what we were doing there. And we said we were just watching the stars. And, and they said, well, the stars look just the same from up on the highway, so go up there. So we went up there, and we picked up Bob again. And uh, then we pulled out on the highway, and the uh, county sheriff pulled us over out there and said, I've got a problem. When the Wackenhead guards pulled this car over, there were four people in it. And now when I pulled over, there's five people in it. Can you explain that to me? And we stayed silent. So he detained us for about an hour and let us go. And the next day, Bob got a call. Uh, in fact, he reported to work at EG&G, uh, thinking he was going back out to um, back out to Area 51. But instead, Dennis, his security chef, said, we're going to be going this way tonight. And they took uh, Bob's car, if I remember correctly, and yeah. went out to Indian Springs Air Force Base where they debriefed him and said, uh, you know, we know about your wife, and under the cir circumstances, we're happy to be the ones to tell you, and your security clearance is temporarily revoked, and uh, we'll let you know how things are going to transpire in the future. Isn't that it in a nutshell, Bob? Yeah, just to correct, uh, you know, a couple things is that yeah. uh, when Tracy went with us out there in the motorhome, I didn't know about the affair right. at that time. Right. And then um, that... Uh, I don't quite remember what trip. What, third, I guess it was the last, the last trip when we went yeah. out there and we were standing out in the dark, and it was it was so incredibly dark. Not you know thirty feet in front of us, or <laughs> the whole Wack and Hut team was standing there looking at us at night vision scopes. Was that the last? Yes. Time we were there. I, yeah, I guess that makes sense. I guess the dates and times confused. Well, I raised the the issue with Tracy, your wife, because I think it it's not the kind of if you're going to make up a UFO story, that's not the kind of detail a man includes in in their fanciful uh, tale that they make up. Is that their wife was having an affair? It's not something you would want spread out there. But you told the story, and I think it adds credibility. The other thing that people it's hard to convey, Bob, is the the kinds of things that were going on in your life. They were making your life miserable. Once they figured out you were telling people about this. There were threats, there were break-ins, there was a lot of bad stuff going on, right? Yeah, it it really got crazy and I was I was really, you know, to put it mildly stressed out at that time. But uh I even went like I was walk at the time I was walking around with an Uzi submachine gun in my car and uh you know, I went to uh I was going to a health club at night with a friend of mine named Mario. And, you know, we drove 
it was close to my house. We both were going there at the same time. We took my car, uh, and I left my wallet and you know, machine gun in the car. And, you know, I had been discussing this with Mario uh, about being followed constantly, and we were making light of it. So when we got out of the car, uh, you know, we said, okay, let's check our doors and make sure everything's closed so the spies don't get us. And, you know, so we pulled on the doors, checked everything was locked, and, you know, went in. And when we came out, again, we were just making light of it to try and, you know, bring a little relief to the situation. And when we come out of the health club about an hour later, both doors on the car are open. The wallet and machine gun are in plain view, and nobody was around. You know, obviously, if it was just a thief or something, they would have grabbed both the wallet and, you know, and weapon. Um, you know, so it was just, in my opinion, just their way of saying, look, you know, at any time we can get into what you're doing. We're following you around even when you're, you, know, you don't know it. And it was, it was really terrifying. I mean, it's easy to talk about now, but it was, uh, that was really a rough time. Well, I can remember it. I mean, I was on the fringes of the story and would get these calls from you at night and, or we would meet somewhere, uh, have a bite to eat or a cocktail or something and, and come to find out we were being followed at that time. I had six different people who called me offering to give me information after the first interview, the Dennis interview, as part of a large uh, project we're doing about UFOs. Six people in a row who were visited by people from different agencies who threatened them, who told them to keep quiet. And uh, these were people didn't know each other. They had just talked to me on the phone. It it was real. It was really going on. And uh, then, you know, some of the guys who were following us years after they got out, uh, and we're no longer working for Wackenhut or the military, told us that that was part of their job was to follow us around, see who we're talking to. So it's infuriating. Uh, you know, now we take for granted that our phones are listened to all the time by the NSA or wh- whomever. But back then, we still valued our constitutional rights and privacy, and, and I certainly resented it. It's hard to convey that, though, to people to let them know that it was real, but it sure was real then. You really had to be there. You really did. Was, George, I have a couple of classic Bob Lazar stories. I don't know what kind of time we have. we got about two minutes before our break. Okay, well, here's one that when Bob was in the program, there were some Russian agents in the Las Vegas area trying to uh, approach people who worked in the program and sort of bribe them or whatever. And because of this, they wanted the people that worked at us for to carry weapons from their homes to EG&G and from EG&G home. And so um, when uh, they uh, they took Bob out there at ET and G, and were going to issue him a weapon, and it was like a little I don't know, twenty five or thirty two caliber, and they told him that they were going to issue it to him, and that if he lost it, it was going to be five hundred dollars was what it was going to cost. And Bob goes, "Well, this gun is even worth five hundred dollars. <laughs> Why would I pay five hundred dollars if I lost it?" And uh, I just think it's a classic that here's a guy working on the hardware from another star system. The Russians are chasing people around, trying to bribe them or abduct them or whatever, and Bob is arguing about the deposit on the gun. <laughs> well, right? if they had only known what kind of firepower you have at home and that you carry on a regular basis. Well, he did. <laughs> he, he, t- told, he said, why can't I use my own guns? And Dennis, his security shadow, said that he didn't know he had any. And Bob said, I've got a forty four Magnum and an Uzi and I think even some of a little pistol. And then Dennis realized that because Bob was from New Mexico, They didn't require registration down there, so they took him over to the substation on St. Louis Avenue here in town and registered registered Bob's weapon. Of course, since the story came out, all kinds of other people have come forward. Now, I have more than two dozen people who've worked at the base at different times who've told me bits and pieces of the story to corroborate what Bob says. But you've had other people that our audience, if you've followed the story, know they've come forward as these UFO messiahs telling their own stories about being at Area 51 – and most of them are full of baloney. I mean, Dan Crane, Dan Burrish comes to mind, a uh, couple of other people who uh, I, I put them in sort of the gray basket. Bill Uhouse is somebody that I think was a pretty interesting source. When we come back, I want to talk about latest uh, developments in the Area 51 story. A scientist who came forward named Boyd Bushman, who was a real guy who told an incredible tale Uh, Going into the break with the Pixies, a song called The Happening about Area 51. Much more to come. Stay with us. 
That song is called End of the Line from the Traveling Wilburys. And I'll tell you, that uh, that is not only one of the best albums of 1989, it's one of the best albums, period. That's uh, what, a heck of a group. George Harrison, Bob Dylan, Tom Petty, Roy Orbison, Jeff Lynne. That's a, that's a heck of an album right there. We're uh, right in the thick of it, talking with Bob Lazar and uh, Gene Huff about an incredible episode in their lives, a story that's now known all over the world. A couple of quick announcements. Uh, if you are up tonight, uh, a live chat uh, for Coast Insiders tonight. Uh, it starts at 8 o'clock Eastern Time, 11 Pacific, with Peter Davenport of the National UFO Center. Uh, check that out if you're a Coast Insider member. A second announcement, we haven't got into this yet, but Bob Lazar has always stayed away from UFO conferences. He's had hundreds of invitations over the years, uh, as well as invitations to do interviews for uh, all kinds of news outlets. And uh, he's always said no. I think the only public appearance he ever made was as a favor to the people at the Little Alien and has probably regretted it. But he's going to make a public appearance. I'm going to be there to uh, introduce him and to uh, do an interview at the International UFO Congress, February 18th in Arizona. If you want to check that out, I think that'll be a pretty interesting little uh, ep- uh, adventure on our part. And then if you want to get on a, a mailing list, we created a, a website just today. It's called alienpropulsion.com. And I'm not promising anything. I don't know um, what's going to come of it, but we're just uh, getting uh, names and contact info for people who might want to have uh, send questions to Bob or know what he's up to. And um, it's a project under construction right now, but figured we would take this opportunity to go ahead and make that announcement. We've got a link on the Coast to Coast website uh, coming up. We're going to get into discussing a couple of other uh, alien or uh, Area 51 whistleblowers who come forward, including a couple in just the last few months, whether they're credible or not. Much more to come here on our final hour on Coast to Coast AM. Bob, in the beginning of the program, you mentioned that stuff leaks from Area 51 all the time. We generally know what goes on out there. But still, secrets are kept, right? You believe that secrets can be kept and that this one has been kept in a way Because even if it leaks, nobody takes it seriously. Yeah, that's one of the things they told me right off the bat. It's one of the easiest things to keep secret because it's so unbelievable. You know, unlike, uh, you know, development of, you know, new war equipment, new fighters, you know, new missile systems, things like that. But this is, you know, so outlandish. Um, You know, for generally speaking, it's, it's a lot easier to keep secret. But that didn't stop them from, you know, using extraordinary means to keep everybody quiet. Yeah, they still didn't weren't crazy about the fact that you started telling people about it. No. <laughs> Did they tell you you're going to die? Did they ever threaten to kill you? Oh yeah, yeah. That was that was made pretty clear. Um, you know, it, that, it, I guess that hit the peak when they took me down to Indian Springs for debriefing after we were caught that day. And, uh, you know, they were, I really didn't think uh, that I was coming back from there. In fact, I thought it was so unusual that we were taking my car. And that's, I don't think I've ever mentioned that before, uh, that about how much that concerned me, because I thought if we were taking my car, I knew they were taking me down there. Uh, because we had been caught, and I thought they were going to stage some kind of accident with my car or something like that. And uh, anyway, the the fact that we were driving in my car is what petrified me the most. And um, you know, but uh, just fast forwarding it, it was you know mainly threats. And I was really surprised I was allowed to go home after that. And I don't know what their mindset was. I don't know if they still wanted me, um, or they didn't know how the, you know everything was going to play out. Or I, I really didn't know what was going on, and that's, uh, you know, around the time that I believe I contacted you uh, because I just became increasingly scared that, you know, something is going to, you know, happen soon. And the main reason you came forward is to save your life. Exactly. Um, You know, I mentioned uh, before the break about uh, different people who have come forward with bits and pieces of information. I've collected more than two dozen, and basically the people who tell me bits and pieces that do support your story. Other people have come forward with all kinds of tales. You know, milk carton kids are taken to Area 51. There's vats of human and alien body parts, and they're creating hybrids. and All kinds of crazy stories that almost seem designed to... 
uh, discredit the overall story. But once in a while, you get somebody who comes forward who's hard to dismiss. One of those is Ben Rich, who was the head of Lockheed Skunk Works. Um, if anyone in the civilian world would know this stuff is real, it would be him. And he made a speech before he died at UCLA. A couple of people, uh, Jan Harzan from MUFON, were in the audience, and he said, we have the technology right now to go to the stars. We could take E.T. home, but it's so wrapped up in black projects, it will never see the light of day. That's a hard one to dismiss, isn't it? Yeah, that sure is. Now, I have to make a comment on on that, uh, not that in particular, but about the stories and claims you hear from other people. You know, there's always been a couple, you know, relatively minor things that I've always kept to myself that I haven't mentioned to you or Gene. And this, the, the only reason uh, for this is should anybody – come forward and really claim they were part of the project there or something, you have to tell me something that I haven't said publicly. And that's right. what I'm always looking for. And that's why I haven't said a few things. And, uh, you know, that goes true, uh, or that's true for, uh, you know, a lot of these people that have come out. Uh, you know, the information they presented is the exact same thing, sometimes the exact wording. I mean, if somebody else is involved in the project, you have to know a little more than what I've said or have said it before me. You know, something has to be there. And, you know, like I said, I don't follow uh, UFO information or, or other, you know, people making claims or get on the Internet and search that. So, I mean, as, as, of, as far as I know, uh, there hasn't been anybody that I can absolutely finger and say, yeah, I know that guy was also involved. Um, but... You know, I'm always interested to find somebody. Well, there's two things I want to mention. One I want to ask Gene about because uh, I, I know that it uh, it bothers you, Gene, to see this story. It, it's in connection with Roswell. Somebody came out a couple of weeks ago, a researcher who is pretty respected, who says, hey, we've got a photo. It's an alien photo. It's taken in 1947. We can prove the photo the stock, the film stock is from 1947. Uh, it's an alien who was uh, the, a body that was re- – uh, the photo was taken at Area 51. Uh, what's your take on that, Gene? Well, first of all, you're more of an authority than I, I am. Uh, this was allegedly from the Roswell crash, right? Yeah. Okay. Did Area 51 even, as an installation even exist in, 19, in the mid-1940s? No. no. Okay. So <laughs> there's one problem with the story. That's a big problem. <laughs> and uh, secondly, I think Bob certainly would be the authority to appeal to thought because a a photo was printed on uh, photo paper from 1947 or from film stock in 1947, does that have to necessarily conclusively mean that the photo was taken in 1947? No, if the, if the material was preserved, I mean, you know, you could take a, to- a photo today with old film stock, and I don't know how good it'll come out, but, you know, you'll still get a picture. Uh, so, yeah, there's no way to really ascertain whether or not the image on the photo was taken in 1947. But I, I guess they had to go there. I mean, let's say there was a real photo of a gray alien taken in 1947, wherever. I guess they feel it's incumbent on them to at least prove that, at the very least, the photo paper was from 1947, because uh, with the state-of-the-art of special effects in today's world, you can't really prove anything with a photograph or a video when it comes right down to it. Well, the other whistleblower who's made a lot of news here in recent weeks is a guy named Boyd Bushman. I've been looking at videos of Boyd Bushman and seeing uh, releases of his for a number of years. He's been interviewed by some national uh, television programs. He's a credible guy. He really did work uh, for some of these major defense contractors, and he's crept up to the edge of saying we have alien craft a couple of times, but until he died in August, we had never heard him say it directly, and he came out with these statements that – yeah, at Area 51, we had uh, something that looks very much like the sport model. I mean, the, sto- the story that he told sounds very similar and consistent with what you said, Bob. But I'm, I, I was, there's somebody we know who interviewed Boyd Bushman uh, a while back who has direct information about the credibility of this. Uh, his name is Jeremy Corbell. Both of you guys know him. Jeremy is on the phone right now. Jeremy, what, what, thanks for joining us for a minute. Um, what were the circumstances of why you interviewed Boyd Bushman, and do you think he was telling the truth? Yeah. Hey, guys. How you doing? Um, hey, Jerry. Hey, Jeremy. Hey. 
So, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we have to talk about this compared to the real story, which is very amazing, and I love listening to you guys talk tonight. But um, I went out to interview Boyd Bushman. We we brought a prominent researcher with us to do the interview. It was my friend Ruben and myself for a production of a film that I was making and I'm still currently working on. And, you know, just to bottom line it so we can spend time on the more important stuff, I found Boyd to be a very nice person. I'm, he did have credentials, but I also found not a single unique, credible, or in any way tectonic, as you described in your intro tonight, George, um, about anything that he said. I followed every lead that he gave. There was nothing new. And he, he didn't claim in any way to, to have anything specific that was firsthand that could be verified. Uh, he was taken advantage of, in, in my opinion. And that's why we never aired the footage. That's why I'm not including it inside of uh, the documentary film that my friend Ruben and I are making. He's a real guy. Boyd Bushman is a real guy who you think was maybe led down the path. I mean, he had a photo of a little was. alien. I know he was. I mean, I know exactly who his primary source was on the, you know, in quotes, on the inside. Um, I followed down that path, and it is an absolute scam. He got taken advantage of, and for the reasons I don't even know. Just, um, uh, do you mean just because of the, the, the alleged pictures of the craft and the alien or his whole story of the involvement? You know, Gene, it was like across the board, you know, when he talks about his insider, you know, who's active and, you know, who, who had hands-on experience, I did some digging and some researching, and I know exactly who that person is, and there is nothing of truth to it. That person works in no capacity in any way. And, well, what, and what reason would – I just don't see what was in it for him, an accomplished scientist, and engineer. What would be in it for him to, to glom on to Bob's story near the end of his life? That doesn't make much sense either. Yeah, and it wasn't just at, you know, just at the end. Like, he had kind of quietly been talking and relating some things to, you know, about Bob's story. But, again, he didn't provide, like Bob said, any information that Bob hasn't already put out there before. You know, I, I followed a lead to talk with Dr. Edgar Mitchell because, actually, Gene, you had said something to, to Lear that mm -hmm. uh, Edgar Mitchell had come out specifically to meet Bob after right. Bob came out publicly. And I just went out there, due diligence to my film, and confirmed that direct from the horse's mouth. Dr. Mitchell said, yes, I specifically came to Las Vegas to meet Bob Lazar, to hear his story, and I find it credible, and that's what opened me up to this whole thing. Now, I did not find that in any way going down the path of Boyd Bushman. And I found I Bushman to be kind of believable. Uh, you know, some things that he said leading up to this, where it went over the edge for me is the picture of the alien and a couple of claims that looks like he was really maybe uh, involved with something similar to this research that Bob was doing. And then he got fed some other stuff that pushed him over the edge. Maybe, but... You know, George, you think they might have him? done that to discredit him? You know, they saw yeah. he was releasing information that, you know, was pertinent to national security in some way. So they just gave him a bunch of, you know, UFO nonsense or, you know, stuff that had already been out and, you know, try to discredit the rest of what he was saying. Jeremy, it's, your take on that? Yeah, Bob. I mean, it's, it's, it's possible. But what really did he say? You know, what was unique? What was credible? What was tectonic? You know, what, what impact could anything he had said? That really, there was none. And, and Bob, he never claimed to actually meet you. You know, there's some bogus, um, you know, polygraph going around on the web. And, and like you said yourself, most of this is just untrue stuff. And, you know, if we focus back in on 2014 and the fact, Bob, that you're coming forward again, which is really the tectonic move here. I mean, George has said you're like the Snowden of ufology. Um, your story has been validated independently by George and myself in many ways, not only the existence of S4 and your work at Los Alamos. Um, but, you know, the, the real story is this. You're coming forward again in 2014. You've, you've, you've dealt with machinery that's not from here. That has impact on, on the minds of, of human beings, on the minds of people. And my question, Bob, to you is, you know, how has all of this changed your worldview or your cosmology? Um, it's got to have impact on you. And thank you for coming forward again. Well, I don't know if I'm really coming forward again. Um, 
It's this me me messing with it, making you. <laughs> yeah, George is very convincing about, well, come on, it's 25 years. You could do one show and, you know, uh, and granted, a lot of time has gone by and, you know, it, uh, but really everything I've, uh, I need to say has been said 25 years ago. There's nothing, nothing new and, you know, certainly nothing that I'm privy to these days. Uh, Yet there's a whole new generation of people that have been born and grown up uh, since then, and they like to know that you're a real human being and a real guy, and like to hear you see you and and hear you speak. So I and I, and I can understand that and appreciate it, which is one of the reasons why I agreed to do the uh, that UFO conference, which I you know have historically stayed away from, like the plague. But I figured it you know it can hurt to do one. Uh, so you know I I agreed to do that. As and well Dean makes show. a. Gene makes an incredible point, and it's true, Bob. I was 13 years old when I heard George and you and John and Gene. And, you know, I, I was that generation. You know, there is an entire generation of people, 25 years old, who has no idea about this story. And it's that important. So, Hey, Jeremy, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I wanted uh, to mention, you know, as you were saying, Bob, about uh, coming forward and speaking publicly, it's one thing to – read you and Gene's story uh, in a book or a magazine article. It's another to hear you, you know, when, when they can, when I have made public presentations and include clips of our interviews, it changes people's perspectives. You know, they, they, uh, once they hear you and see how sincere you are and that you're not going too far and making stuff up, I mean, the story is sensational by itself. I mean, it changes a lot of opinions to hear it from the horse's mouth. Oh, and I can understand that. And, you know, it's, it, to me, the people that think it's a fabricated story really have to look into it a, a little closer. I mean, I could make up a much more coherent story than this. This is, I mean, I, I, I've said that my life has played out like a really bad science fiction movie. And, um, you know, I think the information's out there, but it takes so much effort, you know, to go through and verify things yourself, you know, you've had, and you need to know certain people and have contacts and things of that sort to, to verify some things. But just getting on the Internet and browsing around isn't getting you anywhere except loaded with a bunch of nonsense information. Well, that's the real trick. That's the real trick, isn't it, Gene, is sorting through and separating wheat from chaff in this field. Right, and, and I was really disappointed here what Jeremy had to say. I mean, I still don't understand why a man like Boyd Bushman would. Uh, and, and Jerry said, well, he actually had been doing it for some time. Well, as all of us age and near the end of the road, <laughs> you really don't know when you're going to die. So you can't go, well, I'm out this week. I'm going to die next week. So I'm going to go ahead and unload this week. So I don't blame him <laughs> if over the course of the past two or three or four years of his life, he started, you know, uh, releasing some of this information because nobody knows when when the last day is. So I don't blame him for having de- done it for some time. And I still don't understand why an accomplished man like him would would have any possible motive to try and and ditto Bob's information. I just don't. I, I, I think your guess. I think the guess that you made during the conversation with Jeremy is probably uh, pretty close to the mark in that. This is a guy that very well could have been involved at some level and uh, was going to prepare to speak about it. And somebody fed him some stuff that he bought and went too far and that there's a combination of truth and fiction. As we know, the people on the other side who who continue to muddy the waters are a lot better at their job than than people like I am at mine and trying to to pierce the veil and and tell an accurate story. I mean, these guys are good at this stuff. This secret has been held a long time, and the waters are still muddy. And that is is the most difficult information to sort through is the information or disinformation, I should say, that is peppered with some facts in it. And that makes it extremely difficult, um, you know, to identify as, you know, bad information or a bad information source. So, you know, and that's uh, we've seen that in a lot of information that that's. Least. You just add a little bit of truth to it and a lot of nonsense, and, 
you know, it just it, it makes it very hard. And like I said, yep. they're, they're accomplished at their jobs. They know exactly what they're doing. And We have one segment with Bob Lazar and Gene Huff remaining, and we'll maybe take a couple of phone calls from the public. Stay with us. Edie Brickell takes us into the break with her song, What I Am, from 1989. I should say, pardon my French, the name of that song, Oué Le Soleil. That's Paul McCartney. And I played that song for a couple of reasons. One, it's just kind of fun and goofy and obscure from a 1989 album, like all the rest of the music we're playing tonight. Uh, McCartney put that together with a collaborator, Elvis Costello. The other reason I picked it is because there's a music video they put out for that song. And it in that year, I just thought it was odd that they had an animated flying saucer zipping around over a southwestern desert. Uh, pretty coincidental timing, uh, considering what we're talking about tonight, but that's a that's a pretty cool song. We put a link on the website. We have one segment remaining with my guests, Bob Lazar and Gene Huff. And uh, I have a question or two, big picture stuff, about how they feel, why these visitors are here, if they want to tackle that. And then we'll take a couple questions from you for my guests. Stay with us for our final segment. I remember uh, the night back in 1989 after the story about Bob Lazar identifying him him publicly for the first time after it comes back out of video and I'm sitting on the news set and the the anchor lady uh, asked me a question. Well, hey, do you believe him? Uh, And it was a question she shouldn't have asked and it was a question I should not have answered. But my answer then was, yes, I do. And the same is true now. I think I know that there are problems here and there. and there are holes that are hard to explain, but uh, I don't think they're, uh, you know, having lived with it for a quarter of a century and tracked down every lead possible, I, I still believe it, Bob. And I, I, I think of um, you and Gene uh, every time this comes up, of course, and I, when I hear Bill Clinton on Jimmy Kimmel earlier this year talking about Area 51 and whether he looked into aliens been out there and then President Obama this year becomes the first president while in office to acknowledge the existence of the place and the existence of the E.T. Highway and all the places that this story has gone, still alive, still as hot as ever. Bob, do you, first you and then Gene, it's overwhelming to think how far this thing has traveled and what you have done. It, it is overwhelming. And, you know, as far as uh, believability, you know, you have to agree you're in an extremely unique position uh, and, you know, are able to see it from a vantage point that other people cannot. I mean, you know, we went to Los Alamos together to, you know, see where I worked amongst other things, your contacts and stuff like that. So, I mean, you're able to get it from another level where the average person isn't. And really, as I said before, at this time in my life, I really prefer people don't believe it because, you know, the last thing I want is somebody to verify everything I've been saying and deal with the deluge of people and problems, you know, that would be associated with that. So, you know, uh, when people ask me, what, you know, boy, how come you don't verify this? How come you don't? Because I really don't want this to go any further. It's been a big enough headache, and I don't want to relight that fire so really, if you're upset because of this hole and stuff like that, that's the exact position I want you to be in. I really don't want to be, you know, burdened with this stuff anymore. Well, I should point out that you're here and Gene is here because I, I kept twisting your arm about it. It was not easy, and it's never been easy, not the first time, not any time in between. Uh, Gene, the same question to you. Bill Clinton, Obama, E.T. Highway, the Las Vegas 51s, I mean – you were right there from the beginning and all the way through it. It is overwhelming, isn't it, to think of what you have wrought? Is Gene there? <laughs> Maybe he fell okay. asleep. <laughs> I think uh, – all right. Gene will be back. I, one other question for Bob, and then we'll go to the phones. Bob, uh, in all the material you read and all the thinking you've done about it since then, uh, any idea of, about an alien agenda, why they're here, what they're up to? No, I really have thought about that. You know, it it was never, the information was never given to me about, you know, how we got the craft, what they're doing here, you know, or or any of the big questions that we all would like answered. Um, Really, how how did they come into possession of nine craft? Uh, You know, a a lot of this is just mysterious. And... um, you know, what kind of relationship, if any, was ever 
you know, present, you know, with these creatures? Or, you know, do they just happen upon, you know, craft somewhere? But uh, I don't know. I, I That's a complete blank to me. And I've kind of separated that in my mind and because the, you know, technological aspects, I was, as I said, I've been able to verify, had hands-on experience, you know, research them, tore things apart, and, you know, so that's that's reality in my mind. But I have to draw a line anywhere past that. You know, I've I've never run into a extraterrestrial living creature. I haven't seen one firsthand, you know. Well, did you? No. <laughs> and I didn't, uh, <laughs> uh, it, you know, I wasn't privy to information that, uh, you know, about the you know, the origins of the whole project and where things came from. So that that's as big a mystery to me as it is to you. And, uh, you know, I did, that's just a blank, really. Gene, I want to ask you the question. It's an even bigger one to me after those answers, but go ahead. Gene, uh, I want to ask you what, the question you missed, uh, but I asked you a couple of minutes ago, is you, you see Bill Clinton on television on Jimmy Kimmel talking about a- aliens at Area 51. President Obama makes a statement about it. The E.T. Highway, the Las Vegas 51s, the movies and books and all of that stuff stemming from the story that you and, and Bob uh, told. I mean, it's overwhelming, isn't it? Uh, yes, but I mean, if I would love the story just as much of it if someone else had been in my position. I mean, I think it was just time for it to be exposed. Um, you know, I think, I, I don't know if it's just because we're maturing or the whole world is maturing, but, but um, I, I, I actually connected to the fact that atheism is growing. And, and I think, I think everyone's fear of death and our, our quest to find out, you know, the basic questions of man, you know, who are we, where do we come from, where are we going to, life after death, God, these are things we all examine, and, and, and people are not accepting the old old things that require faith from the Church, and, and they're trying to find out what they can, however they can, and, and certainly if there are beings from elsewhere who are older than us, who have traveled the universe more than we have, People would definitely like to know what they've got to say on these topics. So I think everyone's minds are wide open to it. And uh, I mean, they, I, I know people fear God, and, and uh, nobody hopes more than I do that there's an there's eternal party that goes on after we die. But, you know, in lieu of, in lieu of not being able to know that, I think people are just, just searching for, you know, searching for answers, and I think this was a part of that search. Let's take a couple of calls. Uh, callers, I'm just appealing to you. The The lo- lines are pretty full, so let's get right to it when you uh, get on the line. We're going first to the wild card line, Blair in Sedona. Good morning, Blair. You're on with Bob Lazar and Gene Huff. Oh, thank you very much, George. Well, part of my question was already answered, uh, Mr. Lazar, but when you climbed inside of what you called that uh, sport model, and you in, you called it injection molded gravity craft, and you came up to the gravity console that you worked on. Did you ever speculate what purpose this particular craft might have had, and how it interacted with the uh, pilots? No, I mean the, the the craft's only purpose, because it was so sparse inside, it just looked like it was made for for travel, and because you know, essentially transportation. Now you would think for trans- transportation for long distances, you would need, you know, sleeping quarters, you know, certainly if there is any kind of, you know, creature similar to us. But again, because the travel time is so short, that really alleviates any need for any other equipment. Um, so you basically can run it with just what we saw in there or just seats and the propulsion mechanism. Uh, there's really no need for anything else. As far as how it was controlled, you know, there's no, there was no instrumentation at all in the craft. There's nothing, you know, we call them consoles because they, they stick up, but there was nothing on the top of them, no buttons, no switches, there's no lights. Um, you know, so how it was controlled, and more importantly, what I've always wondered, how when we were running it through the test flight is how the human controlled it. Um, and I was never permitted that information, and that's always driven me crazy. And a lot of people said, well, maybe it was thought-controlled, um, 
which isn't too outlandish. Um, but, you know, how would we even be able to interface to that, um, you know, at that time? So I, I have just as many questions as you do about some of the things in the craft, but uh, I don't know how, you know, the uh, the humans or or creatures interacted with the craft itself. Thanks, Blair. And you, you were disappointed with the progress that had been made or lack thereof. I mean, the fact that they'd had these craft presumably for a long time, it didn't seem like they were getting very far, right? No, it didn't seem like they got very far at all. Now, also keep in mind, I didn't know about 80% of the project. So they may have had giant leaps and bounds of progress dealing with the metallurgy of the craft. And, you know, the uh, on the sport model, there are a ring of rectangular, I call them windows, but, you know, they're, I, I don't believe that's what they are, but they're black uh, window-looking uh, devices. And I've always believed the top part of the craft, you know, dealt with uh, whatever their version of a computer is and navigation system. And I believe those were sensors, and that's how the craft uh, was able to ascertain its position in space. Um, but... You know, who knows? Maybe uh, uh, some of our technology has come from that. I get asked that a lot of times, too. But, uh, again, it's all conjecture on my part. Gary in Tampa, Florida. Good morning, Gary. You're on with uh, Gene and Bob. Thank you. Uh, Mitchell, I'm going to get right to it because there's other callers. I attended the United States Naval Nuclear Power School and was taught that there's four forces in the universe, weak nuclear force, the strong nuclear force, the electromotive force, and your favorite, apparently, gravity. Now, <clears throat> the, uh, I was taught that the reason why uranium-92 is the highest on the periodic table is because the strong nuclear force is the force that holds the protons together in the nucleus of an atom, and that the strong nuclear force only works over a finite distance. And when you start adding the 93rd, 94th, and 95th proton into the nucleus, it increases the bundle along with the uh, neutrons to where the cross-sectional distance is greater than that which the nuclear force can, can hold together, which is why they spontaneously fission. Now, we've gone up to, about, I think, a, mer- a, mer- a mercurium atomic weight of uh, near 100, but 115, this element 115, would clearly exceed the ability of the strong nuclear force to hold it together, which is why when we create some of these higher elements in breeder reactors and such, they only last for about a picosecond because they spontaneously fission into two smaller fission fragments because, again, the strong nuclear force can't hold them to, uh, together. So given okay, that, well, let me, how, how let me interrupt you for one Gary, you're going to have to get to it here. Okay, if, what you're, Bob? if what you're saying was true and it operated on a straight linear fashion like that, then you would see uh, decreasing half-lives from uranium on. And we don't see that at all. In fact, you know, 115, even the isotope they had, had a surprisingly long uh, half-life. So there's much more than just the strong nu- nuclear force keeping, you know, the nucleus together. And, you know, we see different jumps in, in half-life uh, clear across the board as we go up in, uh, you know, higher and higher in the elements. So that's, it, it, it's not just that. I mean, there are what they call magic numbers and, you know, they, and islands of stability that for some reason – uh, you know, certain combinations of protons and neutrons will produce a longer-lived uh, isotope of an element than others. Now, I don't, I don't know that we even now know the exact reasoning for this. It's just an observation, uh, but, you know, that does, in fact, exist. Charles in Los Angeles. Good morning, Charles. What's on your mind? Hello? Hello? Uh... Uh, I've heard uh, John Lear two or three times over the years, uh, and someone else also, uh, and they say, or uh, have said, that uh, we have had our own ships for, oh, since about the 1960s, and I noticed most of the conversation tonight was around 1989. I wondered if you could comment on that for us. Well, I never saw any anything that uh, led me to believe that we have duplicated or have our own ships. In fact, the whole scope of the project was to try and find out if we could ever possibly make them or duplicate them. Um, Certainly that wouldn't be the aim of the project if we had already already had them. Uh, You know, we were working from a standpoint of, we really don't know what's going on here. Let's try and find 
anything we can and piece it together and you know then the idea of phase two of the project would was supposed to be uh, you know see how this could be duplicated with available materials thank you charles ben in pine bluff arkansas east of the rockies line hi ben you're on with bob and gene hi uh thanks for taking the call mr lazar uh i saw a taped uh video interview with you 20 plus years ago and you mentioned that at the time they would take you into a room and that there was a book you were allowed to view but not to remove and that uh, you you did that several times, and you felt that there was information in that book that the that the public had a right to know. And uh, you said there were even religious implications. Can you expand on that any? Uh, well, the there were several books actually. I mean, they, these were part of the briefings uh, that I read. There was also one uh, that was really unusual that dealt with with humans and had some, I don't know if, I, I know I've mentioned this before in interviews, it's, it take too long to get into now, but even the pages were strange, you know, how they, they turned and the uh, images would change on them. Um, now, I don't know who that was produced by or what for, but it dealt mainly with, uh, with us and not aliens. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of information. And, uh, again, they were just overall views of the other projects going on and all of this information uh you know as i've always said you can separate out the weapon potential portion of it but just the existence of the craft and some of the information we got from it uh the existence you know of other beings intelligent beings in the universe all of this you know really needs to be presented not just to the american people but but to the world this is this is too big of an important topic to leave out just because, you know, somebody is jealous of weapon potential. And, you know, there may be other reasons that I'm not thinking about. But, um, you know, all of that information, I really feel, needs to be presented to the world as a whole. Bob and Gene, we got about a minute. I just want to uh, posit this and, and get your reaction as final thoughts. I mean, it's... Uh... You know, you've said, Bob, that you at times you wish you hadn't come forward or you've rethought it and maybe you should have kept your mouth shut. But when you talk about it, when you get in a forum like this and you're talking to regular folks and answering questions about it, you get jazzed. Don't you remember how exciting it was? It was like it was a tremendously exciting time. It was a tremendously fearful time, too. But, uh, you know, compared to our calm, quiet lives now, now being in our 50s, uh yeah that was uh like i said it played out more like a movie and um yeah it's and you hear people that are genuinely interested in it and, you know and i like to relay what i know to people like that um yeah the ones that get you aggravated are the ones that uh nitpick yeah well not just nitpicking but you know People that haven't taken the time to look at the information or study in any anything, and you know they're they're bad on both sides of the topic. You know, overbelievers and underbelievers. You know, just look at the information, and before you, uh, you know, come up with a decision, you know, look at the facts behind it. And look, I I don't get any special dispensation from this everybody needs to use the scientific method and and you know look at things and and proof question everything but, bob lazar uh, uh, we're out of time thanks man can't thank you enough i'll i'll hope to twist your arm in the future gene huff thank you both i'll see you in february at the international ufo congress all righty joe uh, Good night. thanks thanks guys thanks also to jeremy corbell uh, nathan staten trisha pepe dan galanti chris boros and our webmaster tim benall I'm George Knapp. I'll be back next Sunday night with my guests, Robert Hastings and Tom DeLongs. Hope you can join us then. Good night, everyone.